even on the chat today. Fuck. I'll play the video on the 144. Hold on, guys, guys, hold on. Where we got sound? We got sound? <laughs> What the fuck? Good day, gentlemen. We're live. Flat out fever, episode eighty-five. Yes. Shriggity 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 Eighty-five. Too many. No, not too many. It's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> hello, 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 everybody. Everybody that's tuned in or tuning in right now, or if you're listening to this in another day, well, hello to you another too. Another space time. Another dimension. Oh, yeah. Perhaps. That, well, that too, man. Come on, of course. We know you're listening. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is going to be a packed show. I can guarantee you that. Yes. It's going to be a juicy one. So <laughs> many juicy news. <laughs> What's the show even called? <laughs> I think we called it um, Mexico's Cursed Thirds. Flat of Fever. There we go, yeah. And we are going to start this week's episode by going over the, uh, you know, a bit of the action at the Mexican Grand Prix and talking about you know the race and building up to the race as well because there's lots of stuff that happened there. But there's also lots of stuff that happened after with uh, uh, driver movements, uh, some announcement about uh, about some tracks, uh, there's there's just other stuff going on, and in particular, mm -hmm. we're also going to talk Mr. about Brown. the news of Ross Brown. Ross Braun, Brown. Did I say that? Brown, Ross Braun. Braun. Mr. Brown and Mr. Brown, actually. Oh, yeah. There we go. Well, Zach uh, Brown. Yeah, both of them. That's the, the confusion. Uh, the Brown Zach Braun combo. It, it, good things coming up for F1. All of that to come. Before, though, we get into that, I just want to <clears throat> take a quick minute and say. And Unit Z. Unit Z. Oh, well, they. Sorry. I <laughs> <laughs> Two things. <laughs> First, I, I want to say thank you to, to everybody that uh, came to Betty's for uh, to, to watch our, uh, the Mexican Grand Prix with us. That was amazing. One so much the, fun. Yeah, one of the one of the best uh, turnouts, and it was just fun. so many nachos, so many half price nachos. Yeah, and uh, we had uh, uh, this couple that just came from or had, was visiting Toronto from Britain. Stop, stop by. Oh, very, wow. Yeah, that was very cool. Oh well, yeah, yeah, you were too hungover. Yeah, too. I was. <laughs> there's, there's there's this whole uh, another this, British dude. Yeah, this came. guy, yo, Bill. Uh, he he also came like from England and like I guess Googled us or whatever. Uh, so you know, after a year or so, like what what's going on, dude? Oh, yeah, the, did you did you not? Oh man. Oh no. Sorry to everybody. That's uh. Watching right watching now. The video. Another guy from the Netherlands. Yeah, he had to leave before the whole the whole drama. He had, to, he had a plane to catch. Um, anyway, yeah. So thanks everybody for showing up uh, to our screenings of F1 at Betty's. Yeah. Very very cool. Tons uh, of fun. We've been having a lot of fun, and obviously we will keep doing them Betty's for the remainder us. of the year. Uh, so that's um, uh, right up until Abu Dhabi. The next one should be good. Uh, if you're thinking of coming by, uh, please, we will be doing the Mexican or sorry, the Brazilian Grand Prix live, live. Uh, and uh, the bar is going to let us come in at 1030. So uh, come and show up. It's going to be 11 o'clock our time in Toronto. Now, Mexican Grand Prix. Unit Z. <laughs> <laughs> the off brand downforce. He's uh, <laughs> he said he poured his own. This is a comment on uh, YouTube here. I made myself a cheap version of Downforce to drink. It's a knockoff Red Bull type of drink and a cheap beer. It's not that nice, so just pounded uh, half, and I'm calling it a sauber. <laughs> but we, we were some, listening to that just before uh, you said it. And <laughs> some interesting died. news came out about sauber this week, though. We'll get to that after the race review or whatever, but interesting so we do these might have to change the name of the knockoff downforce that's all i'm saying <laughs> all right so the weekend started with um a lot of obviously a lot of speculation around uh what was gonna happen what you know was was rosberg was gonna you know what, what, every aspect yeah well, of course is being speculated uh and just particularly going back to the 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 driver's press conference as soon as they got to mexico um there were a bunch of journalists that were just hounding uh, Nico Rosberg. 
basically just 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 to get a reaction of him um what is specifically as a fallout of this comment that bernie ecclestone made uh that yeah. even if he wins even if he wins the championship um there's just not going to be anything to write it's about. It's not going to be good. It's not going to be good for F1. Yet, <laughs> not good for him. F1 because he's not he's not fun to write about or something like that. There, there's nothing to write about him. Yeah, that he's like a piece of stale bread or <laughs> something like that. He just kind of sits there. He's like, oh, you know, well, this this is how I do my answers in the press conference, you know. And I'm just, I, I don't think about that. I don't think about that at all. And as usual, the br- the British media obviously like was you know trying to get a reaction out of him. Uh, he he was he he, he stuck he stuck to his mantra of like I'm just focusing day by day and doing this thing. Taking I don't it think about the championship. Time, blah, blah, I only blah, think blah, about blah, blah, the blah. race. Yeah, whatever it is, and I'm gonna do the best that I can, which is winning this race, which he didn't. And Hamilton, I think well, just let's put this out there. He had a great start. Well, I mean, he, he had a good start, a start that, like, allowed him to, like, kind of approach the corner. He did cut the grass. He did. Uh, there, and that obviously gave us, a, well, that, that's going to be one one of the big talking points about that for sure. Um, yeah, that first corner was ridiculous. But they both did, crucially, they, both Nico Rosberg and Lewis Hamilton, they both need, uh, did, again, what they had to do, just like just like last week. Uh, or sorry, yeah, just like the week before. No, the highlighted. There's just no highlighted one. It's his first corner. Don't stop sucking. Oh. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, so they just did, did what they needed to do to keep both their championship fights alive, and that's that. That's one thing that can be taking. You mean cheating? <laughs> <laughs> so here, here's the two lines that they did. Lewis Hamilton. Kind of got forced off, and so did Rosberg. Lewis Hamilton just went crazy. He was going faster, so he mm-hmm. but he just kind of went crazy. He outbraked himself a bit, and when look at that, look at that. Mm-hmm. He is like thirty meters from the apex, right? <laughs> but we we can't show a video clip because it's F one, and you can't do that. But if you see Rosberg, he's heading in a straight line, like down the perpendicular to the racing track, right? Mm-hmm. Just off the track. But what he did was before he hit the corner, right where that red line is, that yeah. was his the racing line he chose. So he chose when he was already going in control, in direction that he should be towards the corner, right? He probably would have gotten an accident with the, the Red Bull beside him mm. if he had gone straight, but he decided to cheat. He cut across. <laughs> Neither of the two of them got in any trouble for that. That was kind of crazy. Yeah. Right? If you Shouldn't see- have they gotten in trouble? I felt like they, when I saw it, I was like, whoa. whoa, whoa. Well, especially when you look at the end of the race. Yeah. You get there in a second. But <laughs> Rosberg, clearly, he was going in control in the direction of the corner mm-hmm. that he should like he should be to stay on or get back on the track. But he cut it. Just as a show. Because he saw Hamilton ahead of him. He, oh, he's cheating. I got to catch up to him. He cheated, too. Hang on a second. There, I think there's more of a chance if Rosberg hadn't done it, it wouldn't have looked as chaotic. The whole, the whole grid on the first corner there, and Hamilton might have got a penalty for that, because then he would have been the only car that cut way across the grass by himself. Let's just uh, okay, w- just uh, real quick around here around the table, uh, just a quick yes or no like, uh, racetrack limits should be respected at all times. Yes or no. Yes. yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, that's that's pretty obvious. That's what I've been saying every single day. Okay. So we all like we at least the, the three of us right now agree on that. And and yeah, that that is true. We have been saying that for a while. But just to be the devil's advocate here, and uh, as to you know the, this first corner, first uh, first lap incident, it used to be back in the day that a stewards box. never even looked. At, uh, at, at whatever happened during the first lap, it used to be they didn't have the right? technology for the replays. Oh, but hang on, perhaps. no, 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 no. no. There was there was also an, an element of of let them race, like a yeah, like let them race, like a gentleman's respect. Let each them other. figure it out. But this was also the time when, if you remember, like these when people, if something bad happened, people dead. You people might dead. die. People, yeah, people yeah. were dead. So yeah. because that was present in everybody's mind, topmost. And people like back, especially back in the day when people were dying all the time, <laughs> like every race, there was at least one death. Then um, they all had 
that much more respect when engaging in trucks. Now, now that F1 has become a lot safer, right? And and there's all these big runoffs or whatever, and 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 we still have like you know we we, we don't have as many deadly accidents in F1 uh, on, uh, on track or off track or whatever. Um, then 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 we're stuck with this situation now where well, should, where do you draw the line between let's let them race and let's make sure that that there's still some you know some the respect to the regulations because it has to be oh uh, yeah definitely there has to be consequences worse than some bad social media you get some dirty tweets in the morning <laughs> or after the race right or Max gets the driver of the day again. Yeah. But I don't he know. The, 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 for the most part, sand traps have been too dangerous yeah. unless they're in certain strategic spots where the cars aren't going too fast or too sharp of an angle to catch them like that. Grass is too slippery, especially if there's walls there. Paved runoffs are boring. People were suggesting this weekend, why don't they put puddles on the runoffs so that the cars have to get wet tires for like a few corners i don't know but everyone uh, everyone said that was stupid one of our uh viewers right now just asked so what, do we subscribe to the idea that first corner incidents in lap one should be judged more carefully i can listen i can see where that comes from because if no it should be less carefully not less, which well, is what they do basically anyways which no no like i said more carefully as in you have to think about it more like you know should should they actually get the penalty should they not whatever all these like implications um that that's precisely how it was before right like that's they they kind of allowed them to do that because you know the for first first turn very unpredictable and all that but at this point i think it's getting too subjective it's if anything right now like there's there these stewards and the people that because they change all the time right the people that basically decide whether or not a certain incident uh, is punishable and by how much or whatever it changes race by race sometimes and it's not consistent because they they claim they claim that you know you have to really think about it you have to really look at all the angles and like consider every single uh, circumstance on its own that's leaving a lot up for discussion. Massa last week after the after the US Grand Prix, he wrote a sort of a blog or something and he said that he didn't have so much fun there or something and that he was complaining about Alonso with his final battle there where he he caused the puncture mm -hmm. and uh whatever whatever he didn't get a penalty. He was say he was saying or complaining, I don't know exactly what his tone was that mm -hmm. Oh, Alonso was friends with the stewards at that weekend. Which you know weekend? I mean? The U.S. Grand Prix weekend uh, at Austin. Stop reading this shit. <laughs> yeah, in Austin. Well, the, that's what that's what Massa wrote a little blog. Yeah, that, he that would, yeah, but Massa's been complaining a lot about stuff recently. And Jesus Christ, Felipe Massa, like settle down. It, He's it, gonna be with Williams next year, and that's gonna be his job is to be complaining, <laughs> complaining about things. Who's gonna be with Williams? Is it Massa? He's he's gonna be hanging around. He's I'm pretty sure he signed a contract with him to be like a, a driver coach, some oh. some sort of background guy. Not not in the car. No, no, no. But for he's sure. working with Williams. Oh, I didn't know in that. The team garage, exactly. I, 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 I believe. I wasn't aware I'll, of that. I'll find it in a minute. But. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, Rick, Rick, yeah. So I mean, I'm not saying that it doesn't, and that the the stewards are not completely impartial to all this, but sometimes it does seem like. You know they'll give they're giving certain drivers certain leeways this is what's creating the whole like you know this whole argument even in the first place the inconsistency and i know that that's that's been sort of a talking point for the whole year how and actually for quite some time now that there is definitely definitely that issue that some drivers that both drivers and the spectators, the people on the grandstands, don't don't know what's gonna happen. So, uh, as a consequence of the on-track action, sometimes it's uh, so, some incidents are being judged uh, as infringing the rules, and some are not. Like people are like some people are getting uh, let off. Should that happen? No, of course not. Should it be like like should? 
should we completely rewrite the rules now like like they did with uh, or you know the, the, the issue these clarifications more and more i also think that that's not the right way to go no it's too soft it's too soft martin brandel said one thing like he or i forgot if it was somebody uh, either uh, actually yeah I, th i think it was martin brandel he was saying that listen yeah, and I think this was we brought it up in the last podcast. This was uh, uh, prior to Austin, um, or uh, right after Austin, that it's done in other motor series, man. It's done like other car series, especially sports cars, when they have a ton of track, a ton of cars on the track. They are enforcing the track limits for them by using a number of electronic means, like either putting like pressure pads on the out or whatever, uh, more than just that stupid, uh, what is it that they tried to do before? Um, if, with F1, they tried to enforce it with the, with the uh, transponder, with, with, yeah, with a transponder and a, and a sensor that measured- they, they tested it, yeah, they tested it a bit. Tangentially, at one point on the corner. Of course, I wasn't gonna work uh, properly, yeah, and, it, and it didn't work, work properly no. there. But they're just because that piece of technology didn't work for F1 doesn't mean that another g given piece of technology would, and it has to be. Part of the problem for that, for F1, I guess, is that the circuit is so big. So like setting that up on a five or six kilometer circuit is a uh, expensive and a lot of work to maintain and all that putting multiple sensors on the corner, transponders, receivers for those, and then a main hub back at the controls, for, at the garage controls for all that, somebody to monitor it. Listen, but- And see which cars are going over it. Well, what. I mean, geez, either you do that or you do what Bernie was saying about putting walls. He's gonna build the wall. Yeah. <laughs> if they ever get these drones, that's what I was saying. Eventually we can get maybe like a drone that just hangs over each corner and can yeah. can watch. Why not? Can watch it. Doing, right? like, yeah, we, we, yeah, we were saying that like it was a crazy thing. You know, we were joking about it. Track limit drones. But honestly, like they make a lot of sense. Yeah, or that could really work. Anything like that, man. The technology is there to make these things easier for like it, it could be a lot easier, a lot more clear cut. Car leaves the track it has to get some sort of a penalty or track you know within reason right mm -hmm. um at that point like once you have that technology then you can start asking other questions like oh should we be more lenient during the first corner first lap that comes after first make sure that at least for the rest of the race for the remainder of the race there are some clear cut track limits and track limits and, and expectations of what's going to happen when you leave the track are they gonna have to spend more money to, you know, or, or, and, and really some time to like really uh, develop some sort of a system to com uh, to make sure that there's compliance? Yeah, but it's totally worth it for the sake of the sport. The the drones thing is great because you can pack easily pack those up in a travel case, mm -hmm. open it up at the next circuit, power them with a tether. You have a cameraman or somebody that you just can sits have there a, and, and monitors each one, and you'll then, invest you'll invest some you time into like you know, making some solid programming to make sure that they can be autonomous in like keeping an eye. But that's all, that's all within the realm of the technology that we have today. You have drones yeah. right now, like camera drones that you can buy just for like less than 300 bucks that have a setting right now, like that you just like tell it to follow you. And then you go snowboarding or doing whatever. Yeah, and the drone knows badass. that you're there and it follows you. Drones can do this now. And they have algorithms. You can say like, yeah. do, do a circle shot and it will, it will follow you and circle around oh, yeah they're, so they're exactly so, awesome. so why so not cool. just put a bunch of these drones out to for two things like take some pictures of the track and whatever like some content and you know some extra content and extra points of view and enforce some track limits this can be done and coupling that with like another uh, number of technologies will make track limits enforceable for all the sectors of the track and yeah. for all the drivers there's only 20 of them 22, 22 whatever there's only like there's other series with a hundred cars on track and if they can do it don't tell me that f1 can't figure this out because they can yeah they definitely can especially when it's blatant when it's done in a move like yeah. an overtaking move or something like that once they figure that out which should be priority for them, but obviously it's not going to be because they'd rather keep their little club with like their little bureaucracy and like bullshit favor trading. But if they were serious about like making some changes for the future of the sport to, to really like 
this is it's ridiculous when a fan tunes in, especially like people that are just wanna that just wanna get to the sport. There's a bunch of people out, out there right now that want to start liking F1. Bill Burr being one of them, you know what I mean? Like, like there's <laughs> yeah. tons of people out there that are just starting to get into F1. Venus and, and Serena Williams, and they tune in, and if they notice like that, there's all this leeway and this uncertainty, and and the and the, the rules are just basically made up as we go. That's what it looks like right now, man. Yeah, and then these it's, guys acting like little bitches afterwards, calling each other names, and oh, he said this, but yeah. then, then he brake checked me. That, that, that's yes, that, that's Come the other on. shit. Like, and then changing the results of the race after the Twice? race. Changing the results oh, two times. Come on, like this is <laughs> maybe this has once, gotta stop, man. Maybe once, like maybe it, that could have made sense, or like once in a while, but two two in one race is that's that's insane. And I have I have something to say about that that I'm sure I'll, I'll rant about um, later. I couldn't find the massa story, but uh, I found that he's planning on a working return to. The, he wants to stay in the F1 paddock. Who? Massa. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. I can't find the Williams story, but I, I saw it somewhere. So I don't know. I'm pretty sure he's staying with Williams, though. But he wants to work for sponsors or some kind of just hang just around. Just wheeling and dealing. Yeah. Yeah, I guess he's probably got a lot of buddies there. Oh, yeah. Know, it's fun to travel around. Whatever, whatever. Well, he'll be around. Uh, whatever. Going back. Any, so, so, anyway. so going back to the race, <laughs> we we kind of derailed there after the, the first uh, corner. But that whatever happened and whatever came out of the first corner incident um is was basically dis- decided determined what was going to happen later on in the race now the lewis cutting that corner so hard i feel like maybe the stewards would have looked into it a little more if there hadn't been sorry if there hadn't been that safety car later on that bunched everybody up right so whatever that's how they look at it apparently like it has to be a lasting advantage and whatever lasting advantage he would have accumulated as little as it could have been as it was yeah. um got negated by the by the uh safety car and then after the the safety car we had you know a race that was it wasn't a snooze fest but it wasn't the most exciting um, no. for about an hour and a bit until the end until those last 10 laps and i was it was crazy because okay so the way that we have it set up at betty's is we have in the big we have because you go have two tvs now so we have the big screen the biggest of them uh showing the the race and then off to the side we had the live timing and driver tracker the tracker the app the f1 app yeah basically the official, the official <laughs> app. but so when we were watching it i kept looking at how the how the tire situation because that's that's basically what made the end of the race what it was everybody trying to do crazy things with those tires there making was, them last 50 laps did, i think somebody did 70 laps i think yeah can you, can you find the full results from the f1 yep. f1.com <clears throat> yeah, i think somebody did 70 laps there was a bunch of long stints they just they went out and did one i said that like uh it might have even been during the qualifying when we were talking. Like they could have brought the the ultra softs to Mexico for sure. Yeah. Like they were predicting that maybe you could do fifty or fifty one on the mediums, mm. and then they end up getting way way past that. Most cars did it easily. The highest speed of all time as well. Mm. One hundred seventy one and a half or something. One hundred seventy two and a half. Something crazy. All right. Hang on a second, Mike. This is the. What's up? It's still like. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, man. Sorry. Like <laughs> internet's it, I, should we, should my, video stream. Should we maybe? take a break and then come yeah, back? I don't know. I've checked all my computers. They're fine. There's nothing wrong. Uh, I haven't checked yours. I'm, sometimes things leech in the background. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I got everything. But that's closed. the last thing I can check. If it's not those things, then um, I don't everything's know. closed on my computer. Sorry for people listening on the stream. <clears throat> Sorry for MP3 listeners. If we're yeah. annoying you, yeah, <laughs> the internet's not working today. But you can watch it after still. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Um, so we, 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 when we were watching the tire situation and how was, we were thinking, man, like this is gonna, it's all gonna unravel right at the end as it did. Yeah. It was, it was awesome because cars started losing grip and control. Everybody's back. <laughs> oh, we're back. Okay. Uh, sorry Boy. to all our live viewers that have, uh, promptly found, uh, more interesting things to do. <laughs> the MP3 listeners got to fast forward that 
mess of whatever just well, we can always just kind of cut it or whatever that's do, a lot of work do it in the post <laughs> it might be edited it might not yeah <laughs> we'll see so anyways, during the practice yeah. they're talking a bunch about before the weekend really gets started this track's limited on the left side mm -hmm. the front left in particular is the weak tire yeah so then i was watching the uh the you know G what i couldn't I couldn't, I couldn't tell you about that because i i watched <laughs> so Hanno, goddamn Hanno, get your shit going on. Um, yeah, Hanno was away. All yeah, weekend. Hanno, something happened and he wasn't streaming. So I found this stream from the Spanish TV, and I guess the Spanish from Spain, their coverage, and it was. I mean, it's it's cool. It's it's good. They they're actually doing a, a pretty decent coverage. They have uh, all the practice, and they even have like a little pre-show uh, before the practice. The same way that Sky does. Uh, clearly, a lot smaller budget but um whatever it's interesting um it's that that woman that uh ted sometimes talks to in the paddock noemi uh and and whatever and, and, a, and a couple other guys i guess uh either way that <laughs> their coverage is so it's it's so different like you can tell like the the, the two different cultures the whole at one point they were talking about virgin mary <laughs> in, the, in 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 fp1 during fp1 <laughs> uh yeah <laughs> anyway but no but they, they, they like like i said they do a pretty good job and um for them you know how the rest of for sky he, he does the, the turn by turn mm -hmm. uh you know the, go around the track and like tell him like the, what, what yeah. are the interesting bits yeah. um for the spanish tv carlos Sainz, like carlos Sainz, current driver does theirs turn by turn like you know what uh, what the track yeah. is gonna be like and he was mentioning that too he was saying that yeah because it's 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 left limited and whatever yeah i'm just saying <laughs> he, he he mentioned that amongst among other things he also said that he didn't really like the track at all so <laughs> it's pretty flat yeah it's pretty flat what what i, what I was going to say is <clears throat> so it's limited on on the left but then i was watching the the gp preview weekend show whatever one of those they had a i forget which one anyway they had a clip of gerhard berger from the 80s and he was just commenting about before the race. He's like, oh, you know, it's really hard on the left side here. So I put the hard tires on the left side and I'm running the soft tires on the right side. Mm. That is not allowed anymore. <laughs> but something else, during the free practice, there was a bunch of people, a bunch of cars locking up the front lefts, locking up the front lefts. And then mm. basically like <clears throat> you pit, maybe your balance was off or you hit the curb. You're still getting used to the track. Mm -hmm. This is in the FP1 or two they pit but that whole set of tires is basically scrapped because now you got uh, the vibration uh, right right you flat spot your tire <laughs> but for next year almost in the middle of those two extremes i was just saying you're gonna be able to once a f you flat spot one tire mix and match tires of the same type yeah between the sets that you have allotted for the weekend so Whoa. say if you so say if you have three soft sets or whatever, you take one out for practice, yeah. see how they feel, you flat spot your front left tire and now you're vibrating. <laughs> you pull into the pits. The team can take those tires, take that left, put it to the side, take a front left from another set that you might have already ran, but maybe it's at least not flat spotted. Mm. Mix them, stick you back out on the track. Jesus. But it happened by accident. We saw it happen by accident in a pit stop where somebody went out with the wrong, <laughs> the wrong. Yeah, that was tire. earlier for Bottas. <laughs> earlier yeah. in the season, <laughs> they, they did that by accident. But you can't exactly go with half to half your car soft and half hard. But nice compromise, I guess. I mean, going forward, you, you for can't next year. because regulations <laughs> and stuff gets in the way. Man. And because they got bright colors distinguishing all oh, yeah, the tire yeah, types yeah. now, they used to all just be a, just, a, just black. Which just said white, just a white, white, whatever what was Michelin, Bridgestone, whatever yeah, it was at the, the time. Branding. If anything, black though, sometimes like they didn't even have the branding on top. If you go way far back, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Yokohama. You were you were just expected to know whatever the brand of the tire was because of because of the car. The car would would have Continental or whatever. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, on it. Um, but they they were also like allowed like different cars to run all kinds of different tires or whatever so it's a wild wild yeah. world and i have a thing to say about that later once we like finish talking about the, the race so here's so approaching the end of the race <laughs> um when that when sebastian vettel had had that incident with verstappen 
that you know Verstappen he cut the corner he wouldn't give the position back all the rest and Vettel lost it started swearing <laughs> some, of, some of the most it, man we, the, we were watching this at Betty's and everybody there just we couldn't have enough of that that was you know it, it was great or whatever um <laughs> come on man that was that, that was that was it's what we want I mean we have been we we have said before that you know they should tone it down with the swearing like maybe like maybe just a little bit right but we've also said before that last year there was no swearing and it's almost proven 100 percent, even though it's never been said anywhere in broadcast or printed media etc anywhere they've told the drivers to swear either they, they either told, told the driver or... to swear they told the editors or the radio guys to start playing the ones where they do yeah swear. that's the thing fom is play fom played that out because... in the open out in the main world feed so Cause... what were they expecting obviously they were expecting to get people riled up and that you know it that was... is what make it makes great television it was it was it was great to at least hear not necessarily pg friendly but <laughs> <laughs> separately under the old rules you might have cursed so that that make sure that that radio message didn't get put on That's tv true, yeah you might curse just in there and just say i'm gonna stop for a few fuck you and then <laughs> they won't play that on the tv the, the and the other teams anyway. What's that? They, they wouldn't have, but not. No. Yeah, they wouldn't have before, yeah. but yeah, now they now they got the boop. They they got that noise on, ready to go. They just bleep in all kinds of all, all kinds of radio messages. That we never heard before. No. But out of that uh, whole debacle that eventually ended up in three people uh, being third at one point or another. Um. We now have some crazy, crazy, stupid. What like they're they're fine? They're gonna start finding people? Yeah, Mike's, is that what you Mike's, showed me? I didn't, just... I didn't. I didn't. I actually didn't see this, and I'm glad that I didn't see this because I would have. Like, I'm pissed at this. So I'll, I'll just read this because it's short. Yeah. But this comes from the FIA website from November 11th, 2016. Or sorry, November 1st, 2016. This morning. F1 update to sporting code regarding radio transmission. So this is a new rule in the sporting regulations of F1. From the Brazilian Grand Prix onwards, the rule is following a review of the radio broadcast from car number five, Sebastian Vettel, at the Mexican Grand Prix, including calling the driver of number 33, Max Verstappen, a cunt and a fuck, and telling the Red Bull race director <laughs> to fuck off in brackets twice. The following financial penalties will apply for further bad slash offensive language. The fines will depend on the severity of the word involved. Who was involved in deciding this? Examples include, but are not limited to the following. Category 1, a $10,000 fine per use of words such as cunt, fuck. What is that supposed to be? Is that wigger? And what's what's the last one? Twat? Twat, for sure. Twat. <laughs> wanker. Wanker, wanker. Yeah. There you go. Br British. $10,000 if you say any of those. Category 2, $5,000 fine per use. Words such as bastard, shithead, or arsehole. And category <laughs> 3 fines, which are $2,500 for uses of words such as tit, dickhead, or in brackets, knobhead, or prick. And so this, that was word for word from the FIA website. No. You can, you can go there and find that. No, hang on a second. Are you kidding? Like, are, are you sure that that's from the FIA website? It <laughs> <laughs> was very trolly sounding. Yeah, this is like, I'm. who who put this together? <laughs> not me. I, I know, but this is, this, this is not real, is it? <laughs> uh, okay, let's put up the Vettel ruling. It is real. <laughs> It's right. It's the link right beside it. Oh, you just made this shit up. I didn't make it up. Yeah. Okay. You monster. <laughs> so this is this is not this is not real. This is a joke. This is, we're, we're trolling with this. I don't know. What do you mean? What do you mean? I don't know. No. Okay. Just just so everybody knows, everything that, that Danny just said right now does not apply. That was clearly somebody put that together. I looked it up on the FIA website. There's nothing about that. <laughs> <laughs> That it's uh, interesting though that you that, that you brought that up because there is a bit of a um of like there there is some pushback now. Now I, I don't know if you heard but uh you Daniel believe me right till the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel Johnson from the Telegraph, he's he's um, 
you know, like, whatever happened till now or whatever. Uh, he, he had been a respected journalist. Uh, he won, I think, uh, best young journalist in the UK. Uh, over the winter, like I remember, like they announced it at the beginning of the year, he won this award for journalism for young journalists in the UK at large, uh, and he he he, he does uh, coverage in F1. Now, he he announced yesterday that he's retiring from the sport uh, altogether somehow, and he wrote his last piece that he wrote for the Telegraph was this piece about Lewis Hamilton, right? And mm-hmm. and you know, in in there in in that same piece, he basically like was. Like really wanted to make the point that like listen like behavior like Lewis Hamilton and what uh, what he does with social media in front of like uh, the press and uh, just like you know drivers being drivers should not be penalized like we should like take them for who they are for what they are and 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 really like imposing like any kind of restrictions like that is a bit ridiculous and and, and they, like regulars have to thread a really fine line as to what's what's acceptable to do because if you start doing that if you start censoring language if you start censoring what they can and cannot say like then what's next yeah yeah well yeah that, that, and that's that, what that people want that wasn't real yeah yeah, yeah. That, that wasn't a real story <laughs> but, but you know what? it's weird because it, it could have been yeah you know and that's maybe a little scarier well, do right? you guys both believe me right yeah. sure. well i did sure because much. we're uh we're, you know this is what we do <laughs> the first when i first saw that and read it yeah when i read that page mm-hmm. I, I but I believe there was true too. Yeah, right? sure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. That could have. I saw where the where it came from. Apparently, though, Vettel was like pretty correct about it, and you know, and went immediately he did after. Yeah. yeah, he went and he wrote apology letters. Uh, one thing, Ted though was saying during the his post race notebook that apparently, Sir Monsieur Jean Todd was watching the race, and he was not pleased. He was- a bit, a bit more of a proper gentleman himself. Uh, he was but, not pleased with the tell. But then, <laughs> uh, whatever. That's enough, man. That's like the fallout from this. Like, yeah, I, I guess it, it makes for great press and whatever. But it should, it should have stopped there. A whole I bunch think... of people called shit on him. Christian Horner said that that's not how a champion behaves. Well, he was deserve he deserved to lose the spot. Max Verstappen he called him childish. He called him a child. Yeah, being a child, he's being a kid. He's swearing up a scene. <laughs> the teenager <Yeah>. Max Verstappen. <laughs> They're both now like the, such a fucking. Vettel's in his thirties with kids married. Shit, <laughs> <You know? laughs> shit, the shit talking back and forth. Vettel calls him a kid. Yeah, Verstappen yeah. says he's childish, um, and. Uh, what's it called? Uh, Daniel Ricciardo pointing uh, Sebastian, Vett- Sebastian Vettel's hypocrisy and, you know, and basically doing what he was so vocal and adamant about getting banned from doing the whole breaking under uh, changing direction under breaking. How about Vettel's new use of his, the, the new finger, which he was giving <laughs> Verstappen, not the, mm-hmm. not the middle one that you might be thinking. Yeah. He was giving yeah. the pointer finger, but he, that was great. He wasn't too. giving it to the skies, <laughs> to the number one gods. He was giving it like a no, 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 no. very bad, no, no, Max. No. <laughs> naughty, naughty, Max. Uh, did you see? So there's, there's actually uh, somebody compiled the videos of uh, their onboards as they were side by side. Yeah. And Max was also giving him like some hand gestures too. It was like, like <laughs> uh, there's that picture that I, uh, uh, <laughs> that we saw from, uh, um, from 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 uh, Vettel spanking Max. Put it up again, uh, Mike. Yeah, Hold I on. just re- I just highlighted. It. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but this is this is how this is how Sebastian Vettel felt. <laughs> <laughs> like, I hadn't seen this. He, like, That's some good Photoshop. <laughs> yeah, well done. Whoever did this. Yeah, yeah. Even this girl is like, who made this? Yeah, this is hilarious. <laughs> so that. <yeah. laughs> Um, that's that's how Sebastian Vettel feels about Max or felt about Max right right at the end of the race, and he vocalized that he made it quite vocal over the radio. Maybe he, like right now, Vettel has is clearly working through some personal deep rooted issues. Yeah. Um, Max Verstappen, not in his post race interview, but Verstappen was quoted somewhere else saying that too. He's like, oh, you know, Vettel's got some 
some kind of something annoying him in his life or something and he's bringing of it to the track. Of course he does. Yeah, yeah, you can of see Of course that. he does. This is what that. I was saying. We were for watching this. For sure. When we were watching the race, I think I, sure. I turned to you and I said, listen, Vettel is just yeah. like, he's not acting like a four-time world champion. Hmm. Right now, it's... Yeah. And, and, uh, and this is what I was saying to you before and I know that obviously uh, I, uh, I was, you know, they just obviously not like you know to talking and saying shit back then because uh because uh, when we were when he was having all the ba all the battles with alonso back in the red bull mm -hmm. versus ferrari days uh before the new regulations how there was just something about him man and i can't help but like just seeing this behavior and how he's behaving on track right now like not yes the same guy he's clearly a good driver he's clearly one of the best in the sport right now on the field but i don't need any more proof right now to tell you that he's not better than uh than hamilton and he's not he's definitely not better than alonso or Max Verstappen, right? or, or, or even or even perhaps Verstappen, which really begs the question. And, and and so then, why the four time, like why the four world championships? Is he then actually what some people will, were calling him back then a one trick pony that he can only be fantastic when he has the best car with the super downforce yeah. and everything is lined up for him? Yeah, maybe maybe he gets too frustrated. People that saw him racing younger series and coming up and everything. Well, they might, maybe they saw this frustration before he got to F1 somehow. But I don't know. I don't know. Who, who knows what, yeah. where, what he's going to do? Like off the back of this picture, though, a little bit of irony, a little bit of karma. Go to, go to the picture to the left. This Max Verstappen rule. So Vettel, the Max Verstappen rule and the blue flags rule. He's yeah. been yelling about both of these recently. <laughs> but then, so he was so happy after the, the US Grand Prix or whatever when the Max Verstappen rule was written, I guess. It's been an unwritten rule, I guess, as far as as far as racing's been. Because we saw Johnny Herbert and, and uh, Martin Brundle arguing back and forth about how strong this rule has always been the breaking moving under breaking or make moving twice or whatever right you pick your line for the corner you stick to that mm -hmm. that's kind of the unwritten rule mm -hmm. but yeah this is what Vettel was caught this this paragraph anyways under the reason this is a real fia paper notwithstanding the f1 commission directive to in quotes let the drivers race as we were saying earlier we know the concern that has been expressed about maneuvers, including change of direction under braking, as expressed in the driver's briefing at the U.S. Grand Prix and the race director's notes from the U.S. Grand Prix in this event. The telemetry and video evidence shows car number five did change direction under braking. That's how Vettel got his 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 penalty. Well, the, he got his ten seconds. The way that Danny uh, Rick, uh, the way that Danny Rick, um, it wasn't actually explained it swearing. is that so he saw the Vettel did. Do uh, like that, that he was he, he picked a line he basically picked a line under braking and that was very evident and with that line then he saw he saw that there was still a bit of a gap mm. to the side of him and he said and he and he he said because at that point the track actually opens up a little and he knew that that was going to happen and i guess that whatever direction vettel chose to break under wasn't enough to like close the door fully which is which would have been vettel's intention so he went and changed yeah. the direction and that's when he closed the door that you cannot yeah. do especially after all the crying the vettel He's, and now, yeah he was the one of the big causes of the but this will be called the first step in rule forever yeah. now we, we have yeah <laughs> we have some, some chat going up uh, going on right now on the sorry yes yeah, some talk going on on the on the chat right now is it fair to say that a, that a four-time world champion should behave a certain way? I think maybe, okay, I, I, sh I should be specific about what I was saying. I'm not talking about behaving like behaving in public or saying certain things. Mm -hmm. No, I actually love it that he's, that he's, you know, he's like this, that he's yeah. like this and giving yeah, us something to talk about. Do this stuff. But was... how I'm talking about how he should behave on track. Like we are not seeing from him perhaps what a ton of his fans at the time we're expecting mm. we're not seeing from him do something to the levels of what alonso is doing on the mclaren if and this is what I, and, and this is what i guess i was i was talking about because back in the day when it was just alonso versus vettel mm. up at the top battling it you know i'm thinking of 2012 like those uh, those fantastic 
races that we had everybody was saying or like a lot of people were saying listen like look look at what alonso is doing with that car mm -hmm. like like this is crazy oh and then the uh, the vettel people the vettel fans were like oh whatever vettel's is vettel, vettel is still winning but then the alonso fans were like but no but like you have to appreciate what alonso is doing in the car versus what vettel is doing in the car right. and if it was like if you were watching um not necessarily all the f the, the the four world championships that vettel has because there were some fantastic moments there but some of those races if you were just to like you know judge it on driving skill alone Alonso should have won him. Mm. And but and then people say, like, oh no, but whatever, you just don't know, like, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Like then he moved to Ferrari after after that year when Danny Rick moved to Red Bull. He came to Ferrari to basically prove a point. Oh well, among other things, I'm sure. But yeah, yeah. what a lot of people wanted him to do was to prove that point that he could be giving an underperforming car and he can he can rise up and and win another championship in stellar style and he doesn't need a car that's on rails to to prove that he's a magnificent driver and so far i'm telling you to me he hasn't done that if right. anything i think i give even most improved player to kimi raikkonen because mm -hmm. in yeah. the same car he's if anything he found something in it yeah and i don't know i don't know if you remember but even in this very podcast at the very like close to the beginning of the year when they were still finding their footing mm -hmm. I saw, like, I was, I was even saying, like, Raikkonen, go nah. home, retire, <laughs> right? Like, get out of there. But no, so far he he managed to turn that around. I don't know if you remember, but like at the mm -hmm. beginning of the year, Raikkonen was nowhere, yeah, yeah. and we were like talking about him. Like sometimes we talk about Gutierrez. Like, why is he here in F one? Like, maybe he yeah. should have gone. <laughs> now he's, but you know what I mean. Like he's gotten, he's come to grips with whatever was not working in the car and making it work for him. Why can't Vettel do that? Mm. Because he's not the Iceman. That's it. <laughs> the, I know that you love Alonso. I, I've been cheering for Vettel for years. But maybe it's the, something to do with the Ferrari. Like, the Raikkonen is just the Iceman. Nothing affects him. He doesn't yeah. let the emotions mm -hmm. get to him. Or maybe it invigorates him. Or that's or he just he's just the same and Vettel's doing shit. But don't forget, when Alonso was driving the Ferrari, yeah. he got in trouble for saying, this car sucks. He kept saying to the yep. media, this car sucks. I can't do anything with this. I came here. I thought we were going to be champions. I love the Tifosi. Oh my God. And then he's saying all kinds of stuff like that. They got mad at him. And now he's, then he's gone. And now Vettel's there. He, he's, remember at the, at the start, we've mentioned this before on the yeah. radio. He wasn't yelling, fuck off. Tell Charlie Whiting to fuck off. That's what he got in trouble <laughs> for this weekend. Yeah. He was, he was going like, Oh, molto bello, bellissimo! Yeah. I love it. This car is amazing. Vicente, Vicente, Vicente! He was uh, just yelling in Italian <laughs> to his team, and he was so happy, <laughs> drinking wine and all kinds being of being merry. <laughs> yeah, all kinds of fancy sausage, and then now the, the car has not performed, and he got in trouble the last couple of weeks yeah. for talking shit about it. They told him just shut up and drive. Yeah, it's the same story all over I again. Think just to go back to your point before mm -hmm. on like the attitude of like a champion mm -hmm. and i thought it was really interesting because you know even hamilton has gotten a bit of this way he starts losing starts get getting to him and you have like this not this block but something is stopping you from being a champion again yeah but right? he, he, he went and turned it around and as far mm -hmm. as i can tell uh austin and mexico were like he proved it he, he, he proved that he can yeah despite fair, the adversity and despite <laughs> despite the like constant like rattling from the from the fucking british media about yeah. like his be him being a snap brand and whatever where's your roscoe more, now yeah, well, he's been banging one of the jenner sisters rihanna one of the williams tennis sisters oh, uh, you yeah. see them holding hands this weekend it was oh, it's a, it's a Ooh, la la. <laughs> shit, is he it's serena williams what's <laughs> going on lewis oh my God. <laughs> You, there's pictures of him oh, hold, holding Serena Williams' hand in the paddock on the weekend. <laughs> maybe maybe her sister was at the American Grand Prix to throw everyone off. Ah, deflect. <laughs> <laughs> she was not happy to be there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but how could you concentrate? Whatever it is, he's proven that he's like he's not he's grown as a driver. Yeah, for sure, Lewis yeah. has. And whereas a few years back he did let that kind of emotional stuff happening in his life and family stuff mm -hmm. affect the him. season i think a little bit yeah even but he it's it's less and less of that you can see that there's way less of that going on than Keeping before cool. yeah he took that poll i think by point 
zero zero six or point zero zero eight seconds this weekend. That was so pretty close. When he's dominant, that he can crazy. he can still be dominant. He did it, but maybe Vettel just hasn't learned to do that. He hasn't had to like struggle so much with like adversity. He hasn't had enough time to uh, what is it? Let the uh, let suffering build courage, right? And 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 maybe he's he, he's now like just incapable of of he, he's he's a bad loser, man. He's he's become mm. a bad loser, and and why he's he's whined more on the radio this year than I've I think I've seen any driver mm -hmm. since I started watching the sport. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. let's be honestly is it he's break checking me honestly guys what are we he's doing here become a meme oh, of him he's become he's a meme, meme of honestly he's become a meme it's worse than the finger meme. meme the finger meme was like everyone was joking i think most people are like okay, yeah yeah that's it's badass he's winning all the races yeah. give him his finger <laughs> but this is bad it's bad bad image bad news bad bad everything where bad does press. he go from here how does he? How does he pull like pull his head out of a, out of his ass and Ooh, Vettel, Vettel yeah. and 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 starts to like do something else? Look, look for strength, something else. I think I think that that's very hard. It, it feels almost like he's like caught in a loop of. I think, in my sort of observations of Formula One for the past two years, there's two tr two drivers. Mm -hmm. You have like these very big characters, right? Lots of personality fantastic drivers to watch mm -hmm. then you have these other set uh, i think this goes for a lot of sports but you have these other guys cool as a fucking cucumber mm. yeah. Yeah. nothing phases them they're they are just solid yeah. they don't really get crazy they just stay focused do their thing still very very great drivers but you have these two and you know we have rosberg we have raikkonen right well very very Close Raikkonen is the, the one extreme. Oh, he's like, yeah, this is like, yeah. <laughs> he's over here. We got a Rosberg, and then it kind of goes all the way. And then you have like Vettel Lewis, and Lewis Vittel, and yeah. all these yeah. other guys. Yeah. Uh, both obviously entertaining to watch, but like one gets affected the way another one doesn't. Mm -hmm, right, right. Mm -hmm. So you have yeah. even the cool cucumber guys, like they're they don't have like peaks, right? Yeah, they're just they're just like where these guys are up and down. I can tell you what I'd rather have you know one of these guys over here as my dad than, than I'd rather have a tell as a dad than Raikkonen there's no fucking question <laughs> you know what oh, I mean oh I because guess like, a kid is okay yeah I, it's, it's like, I, uh, I, put, I put him in the car and uh, you know he drives <laughs> yeah um, I didn't really have a point it was more of like an observation oh absolutely no, and, 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 and that it definitely matters and, it, and you can tell that especially some of these drivers at the at the emotional extreme mm -hmm. if they don't keep that in check and if they don't yep. know like how to handle that like it it, call, it goes and it affects their driving and like just rightly so like you said it it goes it, it, it's the same way in other sports uh this nadal a spanish guy in tennis whenever he has fam family problems you mm -hmm. can pretty much like you're, you're safe to bet against him <laughs> yeah. that's and that's what that's what happens right like now I want to go back and so I was reading one of the I remember this was at the very beginning of the year like when at the same time that we were talking about Raikkonen still being shit or whatever that he should have retired again like these words I'd like to point out now that I've thought differently about him and I think that Raikkonen is doing a great job now but back when the season started and he wasn't um, I remember Mark Hughes from the Motorsport magazine he wrote an article I think it was him I'm pretty sure it was him basically saying that Kimi Raikkonen was one of the hardest persons to decipher because sometimes he's on sometimes he's off da, da, da. like you know what i mean like he, mm -hmm. he he tried to like frame mm -hmm. it like that i think uh, you know uh, i'm pretty sure he's saying that you know he's he's indescribable he, mm -hmm. he was fantastic in mclaren and back in his mclaren days then he had you know the this the uh, um, this time in ferrari when he won the championship but then after the championship he kind of lost interest mm -hmm. now he's back at ferrari he had that period before he, he was back at ferrari he went to lotus when he was being great about you know Don't about his driving his snowmobile racing career the snowmobile the the the, the uh, <laughs> going into nascar the trucks whatever it is the, he was he, he was basically trying to make a point that oh raikkonen he's still hard to decipher and all that mm. and i kind of agreed with him back then but now like looking at raikkonen back at his peak I think, like, it's and it's kind of easy to see that 
it's just a matter of having the car how he likes it. As much as people say this over and over and over again, but now it's pretty much it's it's been proven like that. As soon as he finds a car that that he likes or or that the setup that he likes, then he becomes predictable, but predictably good. He might be one is, of the most raw just racing driver. Yeah, that's that's all he does. Like yeah, he's yeah he's, he doesn't he's, do any tweets. No extra media, barely answers questions, doesn't take his sunglasses off, doesn't look people in the eye, he's in the car, <laughs> short radio messages, very yeah. concise, exactly what's happening. When yeah. you hear those radio messages, he's like, something's wrong left. Yeah. That's, that's, that's his, you know what I mean? Like, it's almost a bit very, of a conflict of interest for the sport a little bit, don't you think? What? Like people having, people like love these, him though, so many people but, I mean, like, love him. Yeah, but I mean, he doesn't cause much of a stir, he doesn't create like a lot of attention. And he just does his own fucking thing, which is great. Like, hey, w- good for him. So, but at the same time, we're like, you know, how do we get people in, uh, into Formula One? How do, how wow. do we do it? And like, that, this is why you, I know you guys have both said on the yeah. podcast. This is why Lewis Hamilton is so great. Well, I mean, yeah, he's great right? for, that's, for that's he's great for the sport. Yeah, he's great for the sport. I'm yeah. not saying what Vettel did uh, in his, all of his swearing is good for the sport because it really isn't. It just shows the immaturity. Really but yeah. uh, having him be like that yeah. is kind of good for the sport yeah we, right? we do want drivers do to be want more that. colorful for sure we want yeah. them to be like and we want to see that raw human emotion mm-hmm. and 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 to a certain degree i mean that's uh, he did he's pushing the boundaries there yeah. like telling charlie whiting especially to fuck off yeah. because <laughs> because so many people that's the other thing Brilliant. so mm-hmm. many people respect the work that charlie has done and charlie yeah. is such an instrumental part of the sport mm-hmm. and he's actually so he's retiring or he's doing something else at the end of this year or soon anyway uh, he's looking to like move from uh, from being the race director, but anyway, a lot of people have a lot of respect for Charlie, and I can tell you right now, if he hadn't said what he said, mm-hmm. he wouldn't have gotten that ten second penalty. He might have been Charlie a se- bit, it might have been a five second me. penalty. You know what I mean? Charlie bit me. <laughs> yeah, it could have think... been a five. It, like you could tell that like like it's almost as if the stewards saw okay, what kind of penalty can we give him? To knock that ten uh, or that third place off and put him behind. I want to ask Felipe Massa if these the stewards this weekend were maybe negative friends of Vettel, how they, maybe they were Alonso friends in at the U.S. Grand Prix. <laughs> maybe like, and you never know like who's editing the radio and stuff every weekend. Because would they normally play like? There was a clip of Vettel asking his garage if it was okay if he went pee in his car. Well, that was that was in practice. Yeah. Can I go for a wee? It doesn't matter. <laughs> they, they played that radio message yeah. on TV. That's yeah. not nice. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah. As, as far as being an editor, that's not too, that's not very cool. <laughs> like sometimes you have to pee in the car, as Lewis told us on Ellen last week. He did say Yeah, that. sometimes you get to pee in the car and you don't want millions of people to know no, that come that's on. not what he asked he was basically like said, can i come back in like he, like he meant like can i come back into the i know pits? but most people are not thinking that they're like <laughs> oh my god this guy's gonna pee in his car i don't think that most people are thinking that but most people are probably know. like actually a lot of people are probably thinking that a lot of drivers are out there doing that <laughs> <laughs> now since that ellen interview apparently it's more common than you think <laughs> apparently well yeah lewis said that michael schumacher did it every, every race, race. We see the the two Mercedes drivers, Hamilton and Rosberg, both have white suits on. Yeah, you, oh, see, they you can don't get away with that. In those. Yeah, no, you, yeah, you can always that. see like when they get out, they're soaked through with sweat and just dirty, yeah. just dirty from just it's probably sand and stuff that's just dust flying around in the mm-hmm. racetrack. But yeah, you can't pee in a suit like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, I wouldn't want to pee in any anything except the toilet. Bro, <laughs> yeah, bro, quit break checking me. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the don't, new check your yeah, privilege. Yeah, <laughs> do, yeah, don't break check <laughs> me, man. Yeah, break check your privilege. <laughs> the last <laughs> fucking Vettel, he is. You're right. He is so meme these days. <laughs> yeah, he's. How long? They're he all negative uh, memes. That two like, years. Two years now. Two yeah. more years, or how, how, how long does Sorry, he? How long has he, has he got? Left? Yeah, yeah. Until 2018, pretty much. Oh wow. Yeah, but yeah, oh, there's wow. a chance they could release him. Perhaps I don't. There's all were. kinds of crazy so. clauses in the contract, and like mm, honestly, let's be honest. If he right? wants to, if he wants to leave Ferrari like badly, like he might himself like front like whatever penalty it is. There's yeah. they have this some millions of dollars that you'd have to like pay to like bring Ooh. a contract. 
You think he would do something like that? You think he would consider it? I think he would. Yeah, yeah. I where, think. Where would he go? This is just wild speculation here now, I, I suppose. But you know, if I think that if. Uh, to, just to be honest right here like just to fucking throw that yeah, out to there to be honestly <laughs> yeah 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 just don't, yo, to, to be honestly to, to be honestly without no like there's no break checking here yeah <laughs> I wanna tell you right now that if something happens next year and when Adrian Newey goes back to working full time on the Red Bull car yeah if they start getting some success I don't put it beyond him to go back to red bull and mm -hmm. that's i know that i know that that's a <laughs> that's a controversial opinion but i think that if his days in ferrari keep going the way he is and he's simply not happy he might like justify it to himself like oh you know adrian newey maybe he's making a decent car mm. you know maybe he's gonna make it more like how i like to drive mm. Let's go back to Red Bull. I mm. think that that's something that he probably that he might want to do, but I don't know if Red Bull. I don't would know take if they him back. take him back. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think so, man. Especially with Max and when and Danny Rick, you can't ask for two better drivers. It's mm. it's awesome. Anyways, Vettel's making over fifty million a year, yeah. plus all his bonuses and sponsor money and TV commercials mm. and all that stuff on top. That's a lot of money. And he could, he could, just he could afford to break his contract, basically. Yeah. One or, th one or two more small things uh, yeah. that I have to say about the race. I watched the qualifying on ch from Channel 4 this week. Yeah. I couldn't get this this guy. And uh, Julian, Julian Palmer did not get to compete in the qualifying because in the last practice, in the last corner, he went over the curbs and somehow cracked his chassis. Ooh. So Eddie Jordan during the Channel Four broadcast was saying, "I want to see this crack." He used to he used to have his own racing team, right? Mm -hmm. So who know after this? It seemed like during the broadcast though that he was just trying to make some headlines. But who knows racing for his team? What kind of stuff went on? He yeah. was like, "Oh yeah." If if this was my car, my team, we would have been in the back looking through for some kind of glue, some kind of epoxy. We'd stick that back together and make sure that our driver got out on track. You know, like we do make like sure it, this like, car get out there. I want to see this what, crack. Like, I want to see this crack. Put some That's epoxy, like some some duct tape on it or something. <laughs> yeah, throw some duct tape <laughs> under the floor. <clears throat> but to be fair, Joey <laughs> Palmer. To be fair to Eddie Jordan, at least Joey Palmer said the same thing. He drove the car for the rest of the practice. Yeah, he said he felt good at some decent times for him, anyways, and that he was he was happy with that. <laughs> but in in the Q three. First of all, Verline made it to Q2. Yeah, I think he did that four yeah, times he did, this he's year. Doing a great job, that kid. I know he did, he did that four times this year. So yeah, good for him. Yeah. But in the Q3, I wanted to get the audio, but I didn't. David Coulthard said, "You know, Formula One's been trying to get some younger and younger viewers to to be watching, and I think what we need to do is call the end of Q3 the Flintstones because out there on track, it's all yabba dabba do time." <laughs> Like, Imagine that in his heavy Scottish accent. Yeah. Oh, like that was one, retarded, one, one of the most retarded things I've heard in, <laughs> for sure. When you told me that, I couldn't believe it. I was like, "Why? Like, is he like, is he for real?" And I guess you know. Then you show me the, actually, you show me the clip, and he got zero laughs. Yeah, nobody. It was just the silence, just a, <laughs> a few seconds of silence. It was like a crafty level <laughs> of laughs. It was ridiculous. Yeah, but dabba do time. Jesus. Okay, w one more thing, I guess. Yeah, like, another thing. Like, the, 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 the man stole Tada, uh, <laughs> that that came out of uh, of this race is that now we have an undisputed Nico Rosberg possibility of him winning, winning like as soon as next next race, if he wins the race. Oh wait, hang on a second. Well, yeah. So if if he wins in Brazil, he wins the championship. Full stop. That's right only after. because of those drivers change around. The way that yeah. it first stopped, it was going to go. It had to go down to Abu Dhabi. Yeah. No, it doesn't. Well, so if he wins, no matter what Lewis does next, like next time out in uh, in Brazil, then that's it. That's the end of the championship. Now, how likely is that to happen? Um, he well, uh, 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 Rosberg won in brazil last year mm. and he has won there before both of them actually have won there before so mm. well, actually lewis no, hamilton has never won in brazil yeah lewis has never won in brazil uh -oh. sorry yes that's what that's what i wanted to bring up so lewis has never won in brazil it's rosberg has 
uh, like is is there Lewis is now tied for the record with Schumacher for the most Grand Prix won at different circuits at mm-hmm. 23 right he's won in a race at 23 different tracks and if so if he wins at Brazil mm-hmm. extra pressure then he will have beaten Schumacher most races won at different tracks at 24 24 circuits and if he he's never won there. loses this if he loses if the he championship comes, he would have won the most amount of races without getting the championship ever ever yeah by by Brilliant. quite a bit <laughs> <laughs> rosberg has already has that record doesn't he yeah but that's he's, what i mean so if if he doesn't win super stand yeah like, it'll be like <laughs> for sure super official it's like i used to have it now you got it. <laughs> <laughs> but the, it, it, it's clear that it's even if it goes right down to the wire this is great and it's, yeah, great, for, it's great for the sport and again not I, I feel like i need to say this every time because i'm not i'm not and we're not nico rosberg fans here we're just we're fans of the championship if anything else we're fa- fans of the sport and for the sport it is better that lewis didn't just take it in austin or wherever it is that he took it last yeah year. for sure yeah. oh for check sure. out uh vince's uh comment oh yeah he, he, this is a pretty cool stat actually yes so apparently ricardo is the only driver uh, this season not to have dns or dnf um this uh, for this season alone and the only other person the only other two drivers that join him in that stat are uh Ocon and um and uh what's it called van dorn. and van dorn both of whom have did not participate for the full season so the only driver that's done the full season and not dns or dnf is ricardo hmm. so he's he, he is man he is good he is good yeah. he's he one he's one of the one of the one of the good drivers out there not now i think also i actually i think it doesn't matter if if uh if if hamilton or rosberg either of them wins the championship i think whichever one wins the other one will be the driver with the most races in the season who didn't win the championship oh yeah either way because there's 21 races and they got like eight versus nine right now or something like that yeah so yeah that's that's (laughs) i guess only one race won by a non non non-mercedes this year yeah that's true so there's so many stats with this 21 race season it's so good not all of them are very good stats (laughs) you don't want many of those associated with your name actually (laughs) except maybe the most races on different tracks that's a cool one that's about it though yeah um (laughs) So yeah, so so Rosberg has a clear shot of winning the title, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Otherwise, he'll just what put it the wrong hat on again, just pretend like he won. Pretend, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just want what when we were talking about this, you know, uh, back at Betty's and with other people, like we keep bringing this up um, that um, or it, it's something. It's a fact that's. The people keep bringing up that oh wouldn't it be great for the germans you know the germans is surely it must make <laughs> some sense for the germans to have a german champion Ge- you know, german 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 this german yeah. that and while we were talking about that on sunday with, with somebody else like it a memory came to my mind and i don't know if you remember but in montreal when we were there earlier this year we met at some bar we were talking with these germans I don't want to bring up names but we were talking with these germans and 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 these germans basically like we, we were like they were like oh you know that da nico rosberg and then i said something to the tune like but he's not really german <laughs> he's not really german and, the, and, and they proceeded to agree yeah. right he hasn't he has not <clears throat> even during his racing career mm-hmm. in uh through karting or whatever he didn't always race for germany he raced actually for Finland when mm. uh, uh, when he was young. His dad, who the Keke Rosberg, oh, a world champion, Papa for, Rosberg, <laughs> <laughs> Papa Rosberg, uh, <laughs> Papa Rosberg is, is Finnish, and he raced under okay. the Finnish flag. So there's there's that, and also like he's not really Finnish either because he lived most of his time in Monaco, Monaco right? Yeah. Um, so I, he's I don't think he's somebody that, like even from that angle I don't think he's somebody that the Germans really get excited about right because to not them as much as like Vettel yeah not as, well not as much not as much as Michael Schumacher back oh, well, in the day he was a right. god in a car right, right. yeah but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah he was with Pete there, no there's not a lot of people in Germany really that are getting like that excited about Nico yeah. Rosberg it's <clears> not <throat> it's not like that and actually he speaks German but I'm sure he is just as boring when he does as he, when he's as english 
but also <laughs> i don't know if you remember this but so this was montreal right kind of in the in the later part of the early <laughs> season right uh the beginning of the middle the beginning of the middle <laughs> of the season and back then this 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 german this well respected german that we were talking about said with no uncertainty in his voice that Nico Rosberg would never win the championship. <laughs> <laughs> I, do you remember that? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> he said he wouldn't. He doesn't. He just doesn't have what it takes. Is what he said oh. back in the day. I remember that. I remember that. Like that came to my mind. It was so. Oh, clear. I was like, Man. oh, Brittany. <laughs> he he said he's gonna have to get some mustard. He and, said he was uh, put he didn't it on have that. What it takes because Lewis does have what it takes and that that's not like a, that's not like a that's not a fucking stat that's not like it's like yes. he's got it and he does it na 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 it's like what that doesn't make any sense so clearly he was wrong and if he was wrong that lets me think that like honestly like it doesn't matter how much you know about the sport because this dude knows a lot it doesn't matter how many seasons you've watched yeah He's watched more since before we existed on Earth. Right. <laughs> that still doesn't doesn't seem to give you uh, much more of a, too, of a too, clear too much view. certainty. Yeah, yeah of, of a clear view of, on what's going to happen. And that means that, to me, at least that, that fact alone, that's why F1 is still exciting. You know, like, people that have been in the sport for so long back then thought that it was completely out of reach and there was going to be another... Uh, another Lewis walkabout because mm. it, you know it had to be you know whatever Lu it, 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 there's no uncertainty in F1 anymore yeah would it be Danny Post Rick stars. who went on a walkabout hmm? wouldn't it be Danny Rick who goes on a walkabout yeah. <laughs> with no shoes on <laughs> uh, but anyway just, that's just something Kitchen that I kangaroos with his bare hands that's just something that, that, that I thought when when now it's it's it could happen it it's could happen for Nico so close I only kind of won Nico Rosberg to have the, to get the championship in the end, mm. just to kind of you know throw a wrench in the machine, yeah. just just to, just to create yeah. some chaos there. Why not? So <laughs> close yet so far. We got we got four more weeks. Brazil See, can't come in fast enough to be honest. What when is it? Uh, two two weeks. weeks. Yeah, so not this weekend. The next one after. Um. <laughs> There's okay. no like uh, so, like just to clarify because uh, I'm a sure. F1 noob, but there's no. Um, they're not going to switch the number one drivers in Mercedes if if he wins, if Nico wins. No, they're equal. They're equal number ones, apparently. Oh, Whoa, I, know, what? I know. That's what they've been saying from the beginning, and like nobody believes well, it. One are guy's gonna... got the yellow thing, yeah. and the other guy doesn't. Like, yeah. clearly, I... someone is favorite. Are they gonna switch the yellow son? thing? Probably not, <laughs> yeah. because I think if Nico Rosberg wins this championship. That's gonna be the only championship he wins. Yeah, I don't yeah, he's, he's not gonna do it next year. He's not. No, no, he's not. We also I'm just, said, we also said he wasn't gonna do it this year. So that's he fine. hasn't. <laughs> yeah, he has he not yet. yet. <laughs> I'm just looking at the uh, betting odds though, because a couple weeks ago it was like on news news websites that this is, I guess a lot of people gamble on sports. I guess <laughs> I, I don't. I don't personally, but it was like on news that the odds on Nico Rosberg were even. I guess they were trying to pull back like some of the odds for the whole season for mm. winning the championship, but now it's one to four. He's way favorite compared to, I think this is the average here. Lewis Hamilton is seven to two, whereas uh, Nico Rosberg's one to four betting odds. So he's way, way the favorite still. Oh, but yeah. it's still not over. Well, it is not. It is not over. And uh, some people, the way they look at it is, they say they think. Oh, Nico Rosberg hasn't had a mechanical failure yet. It's he, it's he's overdue for them. If Wait, he gets not, it this race, not, then by the he... way, that's not how statistics work. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the universe works in mysterious ways. That's it. Yeah, I don't know these, these odds though. What what are what are the odds for uh, for Nico Rosberg? Yeah. For Rosberg. That's what I'm saying. They were about one to four average. Oh, yeah. One to four. But they were even a couple weeks ago. And Lewis Hamilton's, it looks like the average is about seven to two. So quite quite a big difference. And uh, Daniel Ricciardo, who's in third place in the championship standings right now, he is 170 to one. 
<laughs> <laughs> so basically it's not happening and then yeah the rest are all impossible you can't better <laughs> you can't better better on anyone else cool are we are, are we done are we done with uh do we, do we close the the race business yeah yeah whole oh, what a whole bunch of shit at the end of that <laughs> do we have anything else to say on strategy oh actually for the race and strategy uh, and stuff nah. so the so the, whole, uh, the only other thing i think that that, that we I mean, that, that, that really caught my attention was uh raikkonen strategy right like ferrari ma managed to like screw screw his strategy up or whatever but mm. apparently then he came out he, he actually came out after that and said that that he had a part to play in that that he basically pushed for that to happen uh when they called him in so um he wanted to try something different maybe he thought his engine was gonna blow or yeah, something because yeah. they replaced his parts or something yeah so like, like i'll just take a chance it's gonna blow up anyways yeah he, he was trying something out whatever it doesn't matter but hey at least he came out and said, this Boah. defended his team uh after the race we had a bunch of flurry of news came, that came out uh obviously like some to do with the silly season that hasn't fully culminated yet but it's looking like so it's gonna close rumors, yeah. uh oh I, I, I actually before i even get into that another thing that happened since the last time we did the podcast is that uh lance stroll is now finally 18 years 18. old so a, an announcement of him joining oh. f1 is impending right now although everybody knows that that's what's gonna happen mm. apparently uh, thursday thursday is the official announcement oh well there we go allegedly, allegedly. november 3rd um williams so, martini so now we move on to one of my most favorite stories that mm. have come out since and is this whole ross braun business Mm -hmm. what do you what do you got on that danny come on give it to me straight you you heard about this you you've seen this you you, you watch the news what you, you there's read been the, about the articles. seven rumors in the past day just on this one topic that okay. he, he was going to take over for bernie ecclestone he was going to be bernie's boss he's gonna work for bernie he has signed a contract already he hasn't yet <laughs> but he could make a big splash back into f1 he's gonna start his own team again there's all kinds of crazy rumors yeah and so and, and most of those are crazy like the, the one about him yeah. starting his own team Be because <laughs> he for sure uh came out and 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 well, that was one of the things that um that he had on that breaking interview with the telegraph with uh, daniel johnson he said that he d will not come to uh, back as a uh, for a team he basically he's he's ruled that out of the equation no like no matter how much ferrari would like to bring him back or or mercedes or whomever He's ruled that out uh, because he, in his words, he's done everything he could for a team in F1. Yeah, so he's brought all the magic that he could muster and that he doesn't think anything that he did after would be a repeat or something like that. That was a good quote. Yeah. Very honest with himself. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, in, in yeah, that's you know, how he's always spoken. That's why. Yeah. And so and in the same sentence, basically, or, or, or shortly after, he's, he, he also said that that the only way that he'd come back to F1 is is basically like to look at it from from a different more more big picture um uh, kind of thinking and and with that i mean uh, i went uh, some some one of the news websites that i was at uh, actually had a little poll at the bottom of you know what like what do you think is this great for f1 is this bad for f1 neutral whatever and it was overwhelming it was like over 95 percent of the people polled said that ross braun for sure is a good thing for f1 uh, if he comes so now here's what we know actually uh so so this is what we know from from the interviews and whatever is, is out there that he is he was definitely interested in coming back to f1 uh, in some sort of big picture management sort of deal it had been rumored that what he what what liberty planned to do with bernie's position since bernie has absolutely like had done absolutely nothing to to create a succession plan is that they were going to split oh, he's going to live forever that's what he thinks anyway um because he has failed to do that what they're going to do is they're going to split bernie's position in two because bernie does so much stuff right now and for it to work properly like for with somebody else they they figured it needs to be split into two positions one person to deal with mainly mainly the commercial side now this is getting the big global sponsors like rolex we have right now uh Heineken. making sure that the tracks have enough um track side advertising making sure that somebody's paying for those etc all the commercial the, the, the deals with the broadcasters and now obviously this in future is gonna 
be it's going to include a lot more um over like what they call ott over the top content i.e internet stuff so because that's going to become more uh, a bigger part of the of the business they clearly need somebody to focus on that full time while the rule making the wheeling and dealing in between the fia and the teams mm -hmm. that bernie used to do as well like as part of like his own appointed role as a dictator was <laughs> is now basically that that role of what they've called the sporting side that that just means that that just means it's gonna be a person right at the top that's gonna keep the fia in check and make sure to lay to, to be to do that like the that liaison with the teams at a, at, a, at, a, at a top level so he's going to be dealing with senior personnel to kind of instruct the direction um of where f1 should go to put it in another pers perspective ross, ross, Brown. ross Brown would as the sporting boss yeah as sport, the ceo slash sporting or something yeah whatever they want to call something like that yeah so there's going to be something like that now i guess to put it in perspective to put it in another light whenever they meet up for um the f1 strategy group meeting is going to be ross that's going to go to those meetings mm -hmm. whenever they uh sit down to discuss the uh the, sp the splitting of the monies and and you know getting new contracts out uh for new racetracks that's going to be F1 presumably stuff, i guess well it's going to be um uh Bernie. no 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 oh uh we got this is zach brown zach brown zach brown's name is still in the position for that so this is what people think it's gonna mm. happen this is what the speculation is that bernie's position is gonna be split into and with with keeping like with a mind to like keep bernie out of it the uh, brown brown yeah duo. <laughs> <laughs> with yeah with zach brown who we, who Sorry, we talked about in the podcast he's yeah. a he's a he, he used to run like very successful sports management companies and he's basically the, he's basically said the same thing that ross brown was saying mm. is that i'd be i love to get back into motorsport i love like i'm putting myself because he quit his agency or whatever yeah. and said I'm, I'm i'm putting myself out there for a position uh in in the sport not with a team so again, like throwing those hints out there. Mm -hmm. Now, if Quick, quickly, just I don't want to pull off pull off track here, sure. but Zach Brown, we've all heard this, uh, which is not a rumor. Ron Dennis will be leaving McLaren. He has not signed any contract, renewed his contract, yeah. whatever. Yeah, we also touched on that uh, in a couple of episodes ago, or last episode, last week. Uh -huh. Yeah, last week or the week before. But now there's rumors that Zach Brown is the man lined up to replace him no that was that's all these are rumors these yeah are rumors. The, yeah these so it's kind of like a brown, circle of rumors of of these three power positions somebody saw zach brown meet up with some senior personnel at mclaren but that could have had nothing to do if zach brown yeah, i think zach brown wouldn't wanna like he already said he wanted he doesn't want to run too, a team too he narrow wants, for him yeah yeah he'd be and selling road cars uh, <laughs> selling expensive hard to sell road cars oh uh, on top of that, like a team that arguably is in the on the decline still, possibly. Anyway, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, I want to get to that later too, like uh, because this BP sponsorship is not like what people think it is. Um, but anyway, so Ross Braun going to uh, uh, to take over some part of Bernie's role. Mm -hmm. This, like people are saying in the chat now, like. We've seen all over the internet, all over the um, the forums and Reddit. Everybody's super excited about this. They they basically see Ron as a knight in shining armor, like he was described in the in the Telegraph article. Mm -hmm. That's gonna come and save F one. Now, <clears throat> I think Ross. to that, yeah, Ross Brown. Uh, I think that there is some ground to that. I think that like I believe I believe that that is the case. I hope I hope it's the case. Mainly because his approach to stuff. And now I watch a couple of interviews after after this got announced. I want to just watch a couple of interviews, uh, and 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 just you know to kind of like remind myself like yeah, Ross Brown is great. Like let's see what like what are what are his most recent thoughts. And yeah, and like what he's saying is very it's it's it's, it's simple, man. He's mm -hmm. looking at it and he and he says that he he looks at things like from an engineer's point of view. And this Bernie wheeling and dealing and like, you know what Bernie does like he so he's even said it <laughs> publicly. He says. I, I put fires out, and mm -hmm. when there's no fires to put out, then I go and make a fire. 
so I can put it out. <laughs> he said that. He said that in interviews, man. It's, those wow. are his words. You know what that like, and that's how, that's how he runs. He's been running his business. It's very chaotic, right? And Ross Braun did does not like that. He's not gonna, he's not gonna put up with that. He when they approached him, and apparently this is something that they did. They approached him way in the past. Uh, like two years ago or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, I guess Bernie or some senior personnel came up to him and was like, we need to fix Formula One. And he's like, oh, well, this is what you have to do in year one. This is what you have to do in year two. And this is what you have to do in year three mm -hmm. and year four or five. And they said, no, 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 no. We want to fix Formula One now. And he said, he, well, he was like, no, well, this is not, not, not how this works. Yeah, that's not. Not, how it's not that works. kind of broken. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so he's come out now and said, basically said that Epoxy. when they bring him in, he's gonna make it so mm. <laughs> having a three year, five year plan is a thing. The way that it works right now, the way that the, these contracts are negotiated mm. and all this chaos that Bernie likes mm -hmm. is gonna go away. Yeah. What does that say to me? That a bunch of that mindless, ridiculous bureaucracy right. is it's probably going to go away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of like that, uh, just how Bernie negotiates, it seems, from the outside. It's yeah. almost like a mob boss. It's almost like some yeah. sort of, like... Yeah, and he has... Crazy family business. He has that yeah. buddy that follows him around. Yeah. Like, the, 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 the tall guy that he... He probably sends to beat people up or whatever, yeah, right? Yeah, the the like, paddock policeman. Hey, uh, hey, you want me to break this guy's kneecaps? <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> uh, Let me know if you see Lewis on Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, though, like, that's so... To me, that means Ross Braun going to do away with all that, mm -hmm. at least. And when it comes to dealing with the teams and the structure of um, the uh, the Formula One strategy group, that's going to change. I, I can tell you mm -hmm. right now, that's my prediction right now. Ross Braun, you put him in there and he's going to do away with all of that or as much of, uh, as much of that as is possible because it's not... It's not allowing anybody to plan ahead, man. You got to right. you got to be able to plan ahead right now, especially for these changes that are coming in the sport. Now, here's another thing. I was watching uh, like I said, I was watching, you know, his his uh, documentaries and I really want to recommend uh, one that he did at the beginning like it uh, in the middle of March this year with I think it was uh, Motorsport Magazine, uh, the uh, the Royal automobile club in england and backed by mercedes so this was like a it, it's 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 over an hour and he's there uh with the guy that uh, i think it was his name was, oh, i forget it's, i think it's nick fry or something mm -hmm. he put together the braun team when they won the world championship he ross braun before the mercedes team was mercedes that we know yeah. they they bought it from ross braun after Ross braun bought it from honda <laughs> so this was the team that mercedes have mm -hmm. right now like some of it is inherited from back when Honda was in F1, their previous iteration. Mm -hmm. Then, then Honda was basically decided, like you know, the, the financial collapse of the of the world happened. Uh, Honda decided to pull. That's when they ran the Earth car. Yeah. Uh, okay. So they ran they, sponsorless. They're showing that uh, we're getting out of this. We yeah. want to build green cars for the road. Yeah. So they pulled out of the sport. They just they, apparently the money just wasn't there, and. They let him like so. So they basically, he said, you know what? We'll buy the team. We'll do something good. And they realized that, they will. And then the next year, the, you know, the rest of history. They they showed up with a car that was vastly superior, uh, from the get go. Like a, from from num from moment one from testing, mm. it was way faster than all the other cars. And then what they had to do because they had very 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 limited money, they counted on Jensen Button and Rubens Barrichello. To, which were the two drivers to basically do as best of a job that they could yeah. win a few races at the beginning and then nurse the rest of the year to victory. Now, okay. they basically, and, and this is what I was thinking, they basically found, and, and, and this was their advantage, mm -hmm. they found not, a, not necessarily a loophole, but a limit, an interpretation of the regulations that worked to their advantage. This was okay. what was called uh, the double diffuser back in those days. Okay. So the car is like, depending on how you interpret the rules, you could have had a double diffuser that gave you way more downforce for with very little drag. Okay. That's what they locked into. And his advantage, and he recognized it, he said it on, um, on, on that podcast, is that it took the other teams about six months to even like, to like backtrack all the development because 
when you put these cars together, mm-hmm. you're thinking a year ahead. Right now, we're talking about two teams years. Like Ferrari. Now. Teams yeah. are doing two years ahead now. Seventeen, eighteen are gonna be essentially the same. Yeah. So and and when you're putting this together, like you show up in um, Australia or even in Barcelona for testing, and you already have an idea of what kind of steps you're gonna take, like halfway through the season even. To looking towards like the end of the mm-hmm. race that year so because teams have such a long like like time that they need that they're developing once they like showed up and and realized that the advantage that braun had was real and that they actually went the wrong way in interpreting the rules to change the direction wasn't easy mm. and or cheap they had to like basically like the car was what like the development that, that they had decided was going one way and they had to like kind of like really like (laughs) turn it around some teams were successful towards the end and like they started to like mount the title challenge and the title did go all the way till the end of the season Mm -hmm. but uh ross brown like brown gp and jensen won it they won the only season they ever competed yeah jesus so just on on the you're just mentioning that finding a documentary about that also this year around the time or at the time of the goodwood hill climb there's another shorter documentary mini clip on youtube it's like seven eight minutes Mm -hmm. and it's uh ross braun paid to have the car pulled out of storage get the engine ready hooked up they had to bust out laptops from uh like 10 years ago that still control the engine computer all kinds of old machinery had to get dusted off that heat up the engine get the fuel the right temperature get the oil in there but anyways they get the car running ran it up the hill climb very cool to watch like they hadn't yeah, even took the dust cool cover they had a tarp on the over the car it was just in a garage well, these, sitting well these things are not just like you, you can't just like you, you don't simply just yeah it cost them turn it tens on tens of thousands you know, of dollars you, to well, hire like 10 or 12 yeah. dudes to come get this car ready yeah, yeah. but wow. it hadn't even had the tarp off of it in years upon years very cool to see that loud ass car run up the hill <laughs> When he was talking about that though and, and actually i want to i want to make a point because the yeah, braun williams toyota they all started with double diffusers not that no other teams had a double diffuser mm-hmm. just the interpretation of what the braun double diffuser was doing was right. not where the other teams had gone with that gotcha um but um then that got me thinking and i realized that that was a huge turning point for formula one that 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 because it was the last time the the rules and 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 a loophole sort of or not not a loophole but an, a, a specific interpretation of the rules mm-hmm. was used and, well that coupled with the fact that the other teams because of the of the regulations because of, of the way that they that they work it it made it very hard for other teams to then turn around and try to catch up okay and that 2000 and uh, you know the bronze championship year that was the last time that that was that, that those sort of sorts of sets of circumstances were used to a smaller team's advantage uh, now I see. this used to happen before kind of on and off all the time right you had smaller teams that managed to become competitive for a year or two or even like a handful of races or two because they found some interpretation of the rules that another team wasn't thinking about or that the top teams weren't thinking about this is be this had been a thing in f1 for a long time and that's how arguably some of the teams with that aren't as wealthy used to keep competitive by right. exploiting the different interpretations of the rules Gotcha. But okay. since then, I th- I feel and I get the feeling now thinking about it that it's only gotten more and more and more restrictive because the FIA then turns around as soon as like there's one of these loopholes or in- things that are open to interpretation. Yeah. Their answer is close it. Yeah. Slam the door and throw add away more the rules. keys forever. Add more rules and add more rules. And after that year was the last year that this has been used successfully Hmm. by a small team because now then you see when the regulations change and and whatever the 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 two times that the regulations major era or engine as Mm -hmm. was the last case it regulation changed it has been exploited by one team that has a lot of resources because 
it's no longer about that one magic magic bullet and it has yeah. become even more so as as the time progress mm. is you, you don't just ha have to find the one development the one thing that's going to give it to you you have to like really be able to folk like focus on that and have a team obviously working on 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 that you know your big magic bullet but mm -hmm. the rest of the car has to be developed at the same time and and you know the, the, and it has to you have to have a working engine yeah and specifically now with um with it being like more of an engine formula then now these like the the restrictiveness of f1 has made it so only the big teams and only the teams with an enormous budget can actually compete for the win we've had right since basically since that last um uh, uh, Ross Brown Grand Prix. Yeah. Uh, one, we've had two eras of yeah. that have been dominated by one team. Yeah. And the, and the two teams huh. have been teams with big budget. Yeah. With enough, with big, with budget enough to attract the, the talent that you need, yeah. and also to be able to spend in developing not just the big thing that's gonna make a difference for you, but also everything else around it, mm -hmm. right? And here's and here's something that I have with that because I was thinking about that. And also one thing that I've done since we uh, got together the last time is I watch, and I don't know if, if, anybody's, if anybody's seen this, uh, but the newest Adam Curtis documentary, Hyper Normalization. So good. Possibly, honestly, man, you gotta watch it. Yeah. Anybody, anybody that's listening right now, if you haven't watched the new Adam Curtis BBC documentary, Hyper Normalization, go watch it now is to me is one of the most important documentaries in recent history like no jokes though like i'm talking like real talk here now <laughs> yeah, don't, hyperbolize, don't hyperbolize it too much because then people will be like eh, whatever yeah no it's it's, it's that good it is good. adam curtis is a badass yeah i think it's partly that he's just getting old he's in his 60s now he's like fuck it i'm going balls to the walls well, it's, he's, whatever it's, i want in well, this documentary it, it's also so he's he, he basically with this documentary uh hyper normalization he he's it's it's a term and i'm not ruining i'm not spoiling anything if you haven't seen it but he he argues that it's a term that was used to describe how towards the end of the soviet union everybody knew that they were living in, within within the soviet union that they were living in a fake world where everything that they heard from the politicians was mm -hmm. fake where everything that they got fed to them was fake and by the media everything was just they were living in an unreal world right. but they fake or like constructed like yeah like, that's what he means constructed okay. um but they couldn't get out of it and nobody's even nobody like everybody just mm. played along and everybody just kept going with it yeah. because they could see no alternative right now okay. i was thinking about that and i was like i was like to what level is that is that happening mm. like is that something that that may be happening in f1 and i think it is man i think the and and the people that um that none is i, I don't want to say that they're to blame but the biggest problem is that the people in the FIA right now, they see a problem mm. and the only way they can work out how to solve it is add more regulation. Yeah. Let's over-regulate. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's keep, you know, closing these loopholes, like make another rule, make another yeah. clarification to the rule and all that. And I started tracing it back as to like when, you know, let's think about how it, what was it back in the day when you know f1 was good and back when teams were able to catch up yeah. to a team that had uh, a big advantage mm. um let's say in the in the 60s 70s and 80s right like this this would happen yeah. and, and even actually after the race we st uh, danny came over to my place and we watched uh the recap of this one race from the 90s or no, was the, the early 2000s i think it was the 2003 or something two or three australian grand prix yeah so 2003 i think we we're watching yeah. it even back then with the ferrari domination uh that was common in those days there were still three different guys from three different teams battling it out and and it was and it was you know they get, a fight down to the last lap with three cars three different Jesus. teams yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. so anyway so anyway you, the level you, of danger 10 years ago was insane you look you look back and you and if you go far back enough i think i know what happened man i think that what the people that were all pro safety 
and mm -hmm. then something had to be done yeah. about safety back then like especially yeah. uh, as you go back into uh um, what's his name yeah, jackie stewart's days and all that he was one of the big crusaders um that that started talking about safety and started moving like you know uh, uh, getting the ball rolling on safety mm -hmm. but here's where it come with like where i think the turning point like or you know what started this all was is because back when jackie stewart was making his noise and all the other drivers were starting to rally up and like really get together then uh, also like after senna's death and whatever everybody's cry was up to the FIA and everybody looked at the FIA and told them, you have to do something. You have to do right. something. You mm -hmm. have to do something. And they encouraged them to basically use the biggest weapon in their arsenal, mm. regulation. Uh -huh. Not regulation also, but regulation in almost all areas of the sport. Right. Back way before, like the, like the FIA existed mm -hmm. since the beginning of the Formula One World Championship. That's right. what kind of made it. But back then they were there just to make sure that the races happened, you know, to kind of to yeah. put <clears throat> the races together <laughs> and intervene when something was like extremely crazy, right? Like right, right. They, they were, they had, they had People a mandate. Barreling into corners and shit like that. But yeah. Or, or like there was like when there was some serious like sporting mishaps, like if somebody mm -hmm. was like purposely crashing out other people and like whatever, like then they stepped in. Right. right. And, and they, they held the driver's briefings and whatever. And everybody was, but after the drivers themselves were so adamant, you know, mm. people like Jackie Stewart, bring it, bring more regulations, encroaching regulations on every single mm. aspect of the sport. Now that has resulted in the, in the days, like the day and age that we live today, where basically like the, maybe the only thing that they know how to do is create rules and make, make these <clears throat> more encroaching rules. And they just don't know any other way to, to solve the problem. And that, just to bring it back to Ross Braun, that is what I think that is like it is where we stand to gain the most. Is that if Ross Braun comes and realizes that it's gone too far, and that what we need is actually to open things up a yeah. little more rather than keep right. encroaching, now, now, encroaching. At this point, it's just the money game. It's, right. It's gotten so hyper normalized that you yeah. guys and I'm sure a bunch of the listeners yeah. believed that that cursing rule was real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that could have, that wouldn't that's, have, yeah, exactly. Wouldn't have been like, oh yeah, I guess. Yeah, that's the rule now. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, right. That's pretty ridiculous. I was still trying to figure out what that W word was. <laughs> wankers. Wanker. Oh, wankers. 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 Yeah. Wanker. Oh, wanker. 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 Yeah, wanker. Yeah, wanker. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, but seriously, you know it. I, and, and I think that that's where the sport really stands to gain the most mm -hmm. is if somebody that is a statesman and somebody that's actually really going to rally everyone together, bang some heads together and say, listen, we've just been going in, in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. And li it, there's, there's no shame in admitting that, man. Yeah. There's mistakes can be made in every single human endeavor. Mm -hmm. Right. If this was a different thing, if, if it if it wasn't polit you know politics and whatever, yeah. Let's 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 not say about politics. Let's talk about you know rocket science. Mm -hmm. You make mistakes along the way, yeah. and at one point, like with the like with the um, with every single actually every single mission to space, they learn something new and they realize that they made some mistakes. They real they accept it. They move on. They make it better. Right. Mm -hmm. And now we're talking about putting people on Mars yeah <laughs> because, because of that there's nothing right. wrong in admitting that the certain direction is not the right direction right but what's really stopping that from happening in formula one at this moment and up until now is that there were people in power that decided at one point this is the direction that the sport has mm -hmm. to go and if they were to admit that that's not a right direction then they would have to admit that they're that they were wrong and, how, and who can do that? You can't right. do that. You can't. You were wrong. How could you yeah. be wrong? Well, would, it, would they lose their job or would they? No, nobody's going to lose their job. Bernie's right. not going to lose their job. John Todd's not going to lose their job unless right. he gets voted out. But <clears throat> he could get voted out. I yeah. hope he gets voted out next next uh, John Todd? election. Yeah. yeah. He needs to go. He needs to go just as much as Bernie needs to yeah. go. Yeah. Hopefully. To go. Hopefully. Anyway, that, that, was, that was my rant of the day. Wow. Yeah. That was great. <laughs> so we've done, we done a little... So we've done, we done a little bit of driver silly season, a little bit of executive silly season. Now we can do a little bit of oil company silly season. Oh, yeah. Oh. So I don't know how big of a story this really is, but so the McLaren Honda 
has been developed now with a partnership with Exxon Mobil. Yep. Mm. For since since they started their project. But now it seems like Red Bull with their deeper pockets or some other type of influence has lured them away from McLaren. All that bull money. <laughs> <laughs> Selling all these downforces. <laughs> well, they're certainly shown more on TV, the Red Bull are, the McLaren. So that's that uh, that itself that's is a an allure. huge part of it. Yeah. yeah. They get more TV time, mm -hmm. at least especially well, for now. And with with characters such as Ricardo. So so the rumors are that McLaren will be replacing them with British petroleum sponsorship of some sort. And the deeper rumor is that it will be of the Castrol brand, which Ooh. I guess is their racing oil brand or whatever, the performance performance branch of BP. It's also the it's last. Castrol. See, I have a thing about that because I think that they actually like, I think that it would be in their benefit more than not to come back as fully as BP as the big BP brand right like back in the day BP like member member BP right <laughs> <laughs> I think probably Castro is sold in more countries worldwide than BP has gas stations anywhere oh well, right? but in America which is a huge market and it's a huge market that they want to actually in the south I know for sure they again petrol BP stations they got hit oh, big they, time they, with oh, that super spill they killed that, that's what happened man killed actually, all those turtles and dolphins in the gulf of mexico <laughs> oh and that and, and and you know what came out recently actually is that um they did it on purpose no 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 that, <laughs> no not about that but <laughs> it's a little dark <laughs> <laughs> um their quarterly result or the, the the results for uh profits results from last year came out and they're actually their profits halved like now this is a little higher than when some analysts have predicted some analysts have predicted like much lower figures mm -hmm. for their and and some argue some still argue i'm sure uh out there especially the people from bp that it's um higher than some of their competitors in, mm -hmm. in terms of i was gonna say the expected gains at least half or most of their competitors probably have to, or more of their sales as well yeah because, because oil is so oil is just cheap now. yeah but cheap on top of that they have they had they were hemorrhaging money with this um with yeah with with the, with the many spills actually they had so that yeah that one the, the the deep water horizon was one but another one that didn't get almost as much press was one that happened somewhere in the north sea yeah. so like they've yeah. had to really really spend a lot of money yeah and it's maybe dawning on them and because part of, part of the press releases that or part of the the argument that maybe BP wants to come back to F1 is because maybe now they want to invest in changing their image in PR, yeah, yeah, right? Absolutely. In and and th this new cleaner image the Formula One is Let's call it hybrid oil, hybrid oil one or whatever, yeah. something like that. They're gonna call it, right? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. gonna be something like that. Yeah. Pow. Powering, powering McLaren Honda two victories. Yeah, some shit like that, right? Some cra yeah, some crazy shit like that. That's that's what they're after. That's what they're probably looking after, like doing. But until I tell you right now, a company like them that basically it's a publicly traded company, they they're they're thinking quarter to quarter and yeah. they're thinking yeah. in investor returns and all that stuff. If once they get into F1 and they start not thinking long term, like they're gonna go away, man. Mm. And especially after these like these poor results. You can say what you want about them, but the thing is, going into F1 would be nothing more to them than a mar than a marketing exercise. Yeah. They're in it for the PR reasons and the marketing reasons, right? They're not yeah. like they're not there expecting to like actually really like do a lot of research and development and develop like better oil that eventually is going to like put them ahead of their competition uh etc 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 i mean i think that might... they're gonna take all the leftover jugs of mobile one in the back of the mclaren garage <laughs> swish them around in the lab and see how close they can get to copying them <laughs> for sure for at least for starters and 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 there's nothing to be said about okay so a couple of drops of this one and obviously like a couple of drops of that fuel this year is very important with the tji the turbo jet ignition yeah. you, you have to have like very specifically calibrated fuel but with a company that's only getting gonna come to f1 for marketing reasons mm. once things start like if things start going further south and further south for bp and they keep unraveling uh the first thing that they're gonna look to cut to cut back down on is gonna be marketing. f1 yeah so hopefully they have a long-term partner they can develop their engine more etc 
Hopefully they've known about this for a bit. But some people think that's the end of oil silly season, and it's not. <laughs> so remember last week we were talking about the Malaysian Grand Prix was talking about perhaps not even continuing with F1 at all, even though they just spent tens or maybe a hundred million dollars on reprofiling and surfacing the Sepang circuit for the motorcycles for motorcycles <laughs> for sports racing for other stuff they're going to continue they were selling yes. out the, the bike races but now there's a bunch of f1 races in southern mm. asia right now demand is dying etc etc but after we had that podcast last week i think it was the same day mm. they came out and said okay we signed the f1 race is going to happen at least for two more years yeah but in the past week Petronas has said maybe we're not interested in sticking in F1 either for much longer. Yeah. They're, of course, the Mercedes sponsors. Mm -hmm. Who knows if that was part of the, the track not being there because that's their whole week is, you know, it's pushing big. putting Petronas in Malaysia, having a big party and all, inviting all their investors, whatever, whatever. But they asked Toto Wolf this past weekend. Somebody asked him and he said no comment. So... There might be some kind of truth to the rumor. Maybe they'll just turn it around now because the race is happening for two more years anyways. Yeah, they just sign. Yeah. But yeah, there were teams last year, sometime in the middle of the season, I think it was in Italy. Mm -hmm. it was, I think it was Ferrari in Italy said, we just gained 50 horsepower based on lubricants and fuel alone. Yeah. Right? That was so just from re re retooling and remixing the, the viscosity. It was and TJI though. It was because we of did TJI. TJI. Yeah. yeah. That's a whole another story about where they get that idea from. Uh, just a quick recap for anybody that's uh, that hasn't listened to us before, that hasn't been keeping up with this. TJI is this thing that most engines in Formula One have now. It's called turbo jet ignition, and what it is is basically is instead of the the, the detonation from because F one, unlike some high end sports cars out there, F one um, their their spark plug has to be a single ignition spark plug, right. as opposed to having like many little like. <laughs> yeah okay it's just it they can only have one so what they did is like they built this like anti-chamber where the so the um, the spark plug doesn't go to the main piston chamber anymore okay There's, it hits a little chamber first where it explodes and from that little chamber it gets like the the fire the explosion gets fed into the big chamber with these nozzles that distribute the fire more evenly and that just gives you more bang per gas oh shit but, but yeah buck um <laughs> uh, more bang for your bang but so anyways there's, there's some kind of oil war is going on not that kind in formula one <laughs> that's the, that's gonna be a very interesting it's good yeah. yeah yeah let them mix it around switch teams around and stuff why not a, a new oil company coming in another one switching switching teams it might, it might even give some teams uh, an unexpected advantage or disadvantage it might give red bull a disadvantage yeah. right because yeah. but at the same time honda's says they got all kinds of shit up their sleeves and whatever whatever for next year so those guys but i don't know anyway so malaysia is happening no, no nothing special about that we do get to see the warning bitumen free track next year and see how it <laughs> improves break the record again the canadian race we were talking about this on the weekend yeah. and something came up that you know bernie was threatening it might not happen it might not happen it might not happen because from two years before 2015 mm -hmm. canada with the federal government promised 40 million dollars upgrades the pits suck they look a little communist mm -hmm. hyper normalized <laughs> everyone's just been seeing the same thing over and over <laughs> but the the city the mayor's office whatever has come back and said okay we can get this done for 2019 just yeah. let us hold the race <laughs> they get a compromise in the works who knows but i was thinking conspiracy time yet again <gasps> perhaps let me, let me put on my hat <laughs> yeah, you got a tinfoil hat no I, i'll we've, just use my i'll just zip up my shirt we've been going to the the race for a couple of years and every year the tickets are on sale the day after the race happens for next year the tickets are ready this year they weren't and the rumor the reason is that the track's not upgraded bernie said no you're not getting a race i think it's because of this lance stroll thing mm. they're gonna oh. wait till oh, thursday shit. let mercedes or sorry let williams say we got this guy this canadian's gonna be driving a car next oh, year yeah. canadians i, I can see that yeah then the I, tickets I, will I go on sale that. there's not gonna be any more 
Valentine's Day special. It's not, not going to be not for you two. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're no. not going to be able to get those cheap tickets anymore. I don't think. No, they're going to jack the price up. They're yeah. just waiting for the uh, big, the big Nick, the big Canadian name on the ticket. Jack the prices. Of course. What's the, what's the, how are we going to get a house, house to rent next time? to? Sixty-seven dollars each for the, for the whole, whole weekend. weekend. Yeah, it was awesome. A three-day pass. We we got <laughs> him on a cheap. we got him on a two-day wow. Valentine's sale though. It happens once a year. Yeah, we got, we got some questions from uh from the listeners right now. Uh, first, uh, Lewis. Are they related. Uh, uh Lewis the Grim. Uh, he said that it was the, the TJI. I guess when we're talking about was this what was explained during Ted's feature with Mark Hughes the other like a few weeks back. Yes, that's what that's what Ted Hughes yeah. was was talking about. Now he's, uh, I guess it would have been kind of uh, ambiguous the way that they presented it because uh, um, Lewis is saying I if I thought that they said that this was something uh, of Mercedes only. No, Mercedes had it they had before it any other team. Like last year, Mercedes had it the entire time. That was a secret advantage. Yeah, this yeah that was one of the part of the secret advantage. This year, Ferrari have it, and actually Ferrari like has probably their second most efficient TGI system because they uh, so they brought uh, another team from Mali this was a big big story big news at the very beginning of the year Mali is this German company that's also through uh, complicated ownership structure owned by the same people that owned uh, that own Fiat so they they kind of did this inside thing where they brought engineers over to work on the turbojet but right now basically all the engines have it in some way shape or form Put Honda it. being the one that probably doesn't have it as good as the others um, and Renault and Renault but part of the rumor was when Ferrari first got it they were the second team to get the TJI that there was some kind of backroom deals to even out the grid a little bit because F1 was getting boring Mercedes was crushing everybody mm. maybe you could just tell them the secret yeah there was some kind of rumor that yeah. mercedes was asked maybe just tell ferrari the <laughs> secret let them catch up a little you don't have to tell yeah. them exactly how you do it <laughs> tj okay and I, now another question is uh, so sudden. with all this talk of fuel and lubricant and lubricant suppliers why isn't the, it the case that there is one fuel supplier for all teams in the same way that there's one tire supplier because money oh yeah well it's it's all about well, companies money. have way more money than tire companies for one right that's that's one one big one the engines are developed well i guess if it was one fuel the engines would be developed in conjunction with that fuel but they have their own fuel that they can develop the engine and fuel back to back with each other keep now, improving that way no but listen okay so i see i i it, this was also the way with uh the tires back in the day right like if you go far back enough there were the tire wars in the early 2000s even before the time the, b- before before there was only two down to two suppliers each team pretty much could show up with whatever tires they freaking Bring wanted the, right? like, the michelins yeah. the whatever. there were so many different tires right yeah um and they were most uh, more than anything tied to the team mm. now even since back then the fuel was always tied to or like for a reasonably lo- long amount of time has been always tied to the engine supplier so it, mm. so each because f1 is so precise and they have to like you it, when you're dealing with like that, that amount of precision you have to basically know all the secrets right you can't you can't yeah. just go into a blind you have to know like you know like the the boiling point like the exact boiling point of, of this oil or or the yeah. gas or whatever what everything all the fluids that you put in your octane level the ignition point yeah the, the vapor point the free uh, everything yeah. you can imagine so there has to be a level of transparency in between your oil supplier your gas supply uh, your, your gasoline your petrol supplier and whoever's de- developing the engine and usually especially with things like tji it happens together um a good uh, um like a good example out there is the, rela- the very close relationship that shell and ferrari have had for a very long time mm-hmm. they clearly like mm-hmm. they, they have a team that just works together with the engine department on yeah. one side and the other side with the fuel supplier to make sure that they're going in the right direction now what would a world um that had like f1 with only one uh fluids and and petrol supplier look like i think it's very unlikely Mm -hmm. because that that that, that would even happen because there has to be that that transparency yeah and whereas shell might have a very good relationship with ferrari if they let's say shell is chosen as 
the main supplier for Formula One, the only fuel supplier for Formula One, mm -hmm. then they'd have to start disclosing those secrets yeah. to everybody. And I'm not sure that that's something that any uh, fuel supplier would want to do. Yeah, unless that was going to be for like a decade, the same fuel for everybody. Yeah. Anyways, back to the circuits. And, and also, actually, sorry, one more thing that I want to add to that. Yeah. I think that single suppliers, instead of evening the, the field out, they actually cause most, more disparity. It's just it's just yeah. clamping on more rules. And it's more regulations. That's, that's, that's what I was less say, of actually. what we need. Yeah. Yeah. Pull the, yeah. yeah. So this was Wednesday. Wednesday, I think. Some group called SPB Racing in Russia posted what they allege to be a Hermann Tilke designed St. Petersburg Formula One class racing circuit. Oh, they've been floating that for a while. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, since the 80s, Bernie's been pushing Moscow, yeah. which would be badass. So this is would be a full-on racing facility, which would be located at a ski resort. I don't know which one. I don't read Russian. It's at a ski resort <laughs> like 60 kilometers north from St. Petersburg, so pretty close to the city. That's designed by Tilki. It's 4.8 kilometers. It's a clockwise circuit. It's got nine rights and eight lefts. That doesn't look bad, actually. It's got 20 meters of elevation. How, how, how big is the whole track? Lot. 4.8 kilometers. That's not bad, man. 20 meters elevation. Cool. Looks all right. Doesn't look like anything too spectacular. But it's look got at the pits on the outside. So, so look at runs the runs clockwise. Look, look at the bottom part of it. The first corner, those look how some, wide it is. Those are some nice sweeping corners. Mm. Look how big the first corner is super wide and open. You sort of like break slow, 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 slow and then into a 90. So who, I don't know. I couldn't uh, really find out if this was actually real. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. If anyone who reads Russian and listens to this, maybe you could check it out. But, uh, Let us know. There's no name for the circuit. It's just the St. Petersburg circular circuit, I guess. But uh, apparently, Tokyo made this. Another Tokyo drone. Hmm. You know, you know why I think that that could actually work. Hmm. Having a race in St. Petersburg instead of Moscow, because St. Petersburg is on the Baltic. Hmm. There's, it's way easier to get to St. Petersburg. Uh, from anywhere in the north in the north of Europe, and right now that's a hot spot for F1 with Dutch Senna joining the ranks. Uh, you know, Ericsson gets his shit together, and there's actually just overall more interest in the sport now coming from the Scandinavian countries, uh, from the north of Europe. There's kind of like a revival, and it's very like Swedish people do this all the time. Apparently, they go on cruises to St. Petersburg, like because it's it's just down the Baltic. Whereas getting to Moscow from many like Central and um, Western European countries is actually quite far and not like not very convenient. Right? Yeah, and then that way, well, they just that was a whole money laundering corrupt thing. Anyways, then yeah. the the Russian federal government could just get rid of the entire Sochi Olympic complex completely just mm -hmm. forget about it oh they don't let it anything. let it fall apart and rot that track doesn't need to be used anymore we got a new one yeah don't worry about the buildings nobody swims there whatever <laughs> whatever this track looks cool right and then it's at a ski resort so and it'll get some nice hotels and facilities already it'll get some northern spas. europeans there yeah so it, some fancy people lots of stuff for them to do yeah i think i think i think that they're i as much as I, as I don't think it's going to happen, I think that there's some meat to it, you know? Mm -hmm. There is some meat to that story. Mm -hmm. Hey, actually, before we get sidetracked, I wanted to bring up Ocon going to Force India. That's pretty much been almost confirmed now, too, right? Everybody's talking about that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, as of this morning, it's been announced. There's uh, some sort of official photograph of him floating around in the suit, in the race suit. But that, that was from way earlier, wasn't it? From, like, back in the day when yeah. he was testing for them? I don't know. Now, really sorry, go ahead. No, that's it. Okay, here, here's something that like that struck me because I thought like as soon as I saw it, I remembered reading way back, and I think we might have talked about it this in the podcast, like last podcast or the podcast before, how whoever was gonna go in that second Force India seat was basically a power struggle in between Bernie and Mercedes, mm. because you know as much as he'd like to say, um, well, what's his name, <laughs> VJ Mali had. I had apparently no say on who on who goes in that seat. It's either what Bernie wanted, which apparently Bernie wanted um, 
Felipe Nasser there to keep to the keep Brazilian, the Brazilian in a seat. Right. Yeah, to, yeah, to, yeah, to, just to have a Brazilian, right? Uh, Their race is in trouble too now. Oh yeah, because mon- Olympics money. Mm-hmm. So, Bernie wanted Nasser, and Mercedes wanted whoever they wanted. Clearly, Mercedes and Toto Wolf won that battle, that power struggle with Bernie. So yet again, we're seeing another instance of Bernie's power being undermined. I think, like. I think he's gonna snap one of these days, man. Like he's I hope so. He's he's seeing left, right, and center examples of his power eroding. No, the the media doesn't care about him anymore. They wanna just hear from Chase Carey. Uh Ross <clears throat> Braun just got signed way like under his he you know he towards the end of Ross Braun being in F one they didn't get along. And like he's gonna be basically forced he's gonna be forced to work not only work with Ross Braun to listen to what Ross Braun has to say. And he's not going to like that. Remember at Singapore when he like, like push, pushed that dude out of the way. Yeah. yeah the yeah. guy's walking backwards. <laughs> almost shoved him over and cracked his head open. Man, it's been delicious to watch the fall of Bernie. And well, there we may, go. long may it continue. Oh, come on. <laughs> Hopefully he can give, uh, give some, give, uh, what do you think about that, that worth. seat though? Like, like do, do, you, do you think that was a good move by every, all the parties involved? It should, yeah, it, it should be. Perez is the senior guy now. But right? why him? Okay. Why him and why not Verline in that in that seat? I don't know. Why not? Well, I'm just well, saying. Like, yeah. is he is he really that much more like that much more impressive than Verline? It's Maybe, like, but we sure. Bernie hinted at that deal with like Verline's getting special bits down at Manor. He's maybe a bit younger. Maybe he can improve a little more because he seems like he might be one of the guys. Mm-hmm. That could do something for real. Yeah. Like I said, he gave it, put that piece of shit into Q2 a few times. Yeah. So, yeah, who yeah, who knows? I think Verline next year will be his year to, to move up. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Hulkenberg moved over to Renault. The second seat, a lot of people were thinking, probably wishfully, a lot of French people were thinking Ocon was going to take that. Yes. But which uh, we were saying before the show doesn't make sense because he drives for Mercedes, even though he's French. Doesn't make sense for a Renault to be having a Mercedes driver. Mm-hmm. Doesn't make any sense at all. But yeah, I guess that that second Renault seat is still open though. Could be I don't know. Harry Anto said that he still feels like he has about a fifty fifty chance of coming back. So I don't know. I don't think so. But yeah, I guess now there's at least two seats still open. Wide open. Yeah, let's let's talk about those seats. So we're talking about the high seat. Yep. And the The Renault seat. And and, and the Marussia. One of the Marussia. So yeah, there's so, oh, yeah, so three, sorry, there's one of the three, three of them. Three of them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so or maybe like, Gutierrez probably is not gonna be around anymore. I hope so, man. Yeah, I think I think that seat's open. <laughs> Ocon Ocon seat. And and the Renault, uh, yeah, I don't know. So, okay, so all, all three of them have been extremely coy about the the team's leadership. Have been uh, holding back the straight face, poker face, no answers. So let's start from the bottom right now. Actually, and and there's a, uh, I, well, actually, who, who knows about what Sauber are gonna do next? I year. think I have an idea. I'll tell you in a minute. Okay, so let's start from the bottom then. Sauber. So actually, we're talking about really. We're talking about four seats. We're talking about that Sauber seat, the Haas seat, the Manor seat, and the Renault seat. Yeah. So, in that order, let's discuss. So it's the Sauber seat. What do you think they're gonna put in there? I think Nazar is gonna stay. Yeah. Yes. Nazar okay. and Ericsson will both be in those two seats because there has to be a Brazilian in F1 somehow, right? Uh, partly and partly because of the news I'm gonna share with you in a minute. Yeah, I think he will be there because he's Brazilian. They'll find some more sponsor- Brazilian sponsorship. Some rich guy will be like, yeah, my country's cool. Let's keep him on TV. But aside from that, there's some even bigger news. Okay. But okay. So we'll, we'll, I guess we'll, stay on track for a second. Yeah. Right. So the second uh, seat uh, then uh, okay, going up would be the manor seat. Yes. So um, who to that? So clearly the manor seat, I think, and here's, here's, here's just wild speculation i think that they didn't jump at the possibility of moving verline to force india because 
he'll Ford. be the team leader next year. Well, he, he'll be the team, team leader in Manor, and maybe Mercedes is more serious about bringing up the Manor team even further up the midfield. If, it's possible. Yeah, if with all this, like, you know, no tokens and whatever, and, and, and there's going to be more collaboration and, and maybe, like, start, like, a more serious driver um like driver academy kind of like building driver building program like junior driver over program, time yeah yeah they might want to bring manor a little bit further up so for manor mercedes yeah for, make it like a for real manor mercedes so in that in that sense uh verline being there like it doesn't stop his development as a driver you know what i mean like he'll still be without moving out of that team he'll still be moving uh, up or moving forward with his career, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that whoever goes in that second manor seat is going to be dictated by Mercedes. It's going to be like, it's going to be one of their boys, whoever they want. There's been a lot of speculation for that. Yeah. That yeah. Mercedes really controls that seat. Yeah. But maybe they only really control the one thing. They're going to keep Verlaine there. And maybe just, they maybe they really only do right and then and then who, but then who's gonna be in the second seat just just uh like somebody from Arianto said this week 50 50 he's 50 50 oh yeah okay <laughs> he said he's still 50 50 so maybe he found some more money somewhere from his countrymen yeah i don't know so let's leave that as a blank because there's way too many um questions about that i mean it could be it could be Harianto just as easily as it could be uh, like we, we saw Alexander Rossi in the States, although it, it's probably not going to be Rossi at all. But no, I think he'll, he'll be back in Indy. But maybe somebody from a, a different uh, feeder series. Yeah, perhaps. Like, but but has, a, has said they're not in any rush or care to get an American specifically anyway. Well, which I'm still talking about. Uh, so, manner. Oh, the manner. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Well, no, we can't find. Let's talk about, 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 about Haas now. So Haas, I actually think that much like Mercedes has like a say on who gets the second seat here and there, I think Ferrari has a say on who gets that seat. Yeah, I think yeah, I think they do. You know who? Maybe they should send Vettel down for a year just to show him what's up. <laughs> see how much he really wants to drive for Ferrari. <clears throat> that would be hilarious if they actually do that. Oh, I would love that. Um, I'm a fan, but goddamn, he needs that. Need some discipline, <laughs> but no, I, I, don't, I don't know. Who's, that, so who's in? Um, silly season's being pretty silly. Like, do you do you think that they put misdirections like, like Lurk in there? I I think the idea has been floated, but they've said over and over again that like Clerk, he's he's just not ready, man. Yeah, it, I agree with that. From the numbers that we were looking at last week, I don't know. It he's, seems that way, but he's he, one of the best underneath F one, but. He might not be the guy yet. He was still, like, very, very impressive uh, in his year that he did Formula 3. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's just, they kind of left it at that. Like, he, like, since then, he's, like, he's been doing a great job. Mm -hmm. But he hasn't, uh, he hasn't impressed them in terms of their, uh, of, of his maturity. They, they There's this idea that he may not be mature enough to to jump on the spot right now mm -hmm. now if not him then who now let me just read you the roster that they have uh in the ferrari driver academy if they were to pull from the from the fda uh so charlotte Leclerc, of course at, at the top but then there's this kid antonio fuoco an italian um that he has been uh racing uh right now i believe in as in gp2 or gp uh yeah uh, he is whatever so him. antonio foco he actually might be an interesting choice actually because he's old he's an older guy he might be good to have there just as a placeholder to see to see if he performs to with any kind of uh, of level if you put him in an f1 car and i think he might be the the guy that they actually want for that manor seat or sorry for the for the Haas seat well I mean the, the speculation is that they do because he's Italian or that they might because he's Italian mm -hmm. and Ferrari hasn't had an Italian driver driving for them in a very long time and yeah. there's 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 pressure from the country or whatever anyway so Antonio Fuoco maybe that maybe that seat maybe it's somebody else uh, maybe they give it to somebody else not an American though mm. Gene Haas has already said that 
he'd love he, well he'd, he well he he says something interesting like he'd love for it for there to be an American driver mm. but he's looked around and basically nobody really impresses him yet. No. All right. Yeah. <laughs> if anything America likes more than um, cars and booze, it's a challenge. Right? Yeah, <laughs> oh, what? You going to tell me what? Yeah. Well, hope yeah, hopefully they come up with a good driver Please. too. Please. Yeah. Please uh, do. If, yeah. And then that then just leaves us with the last remaining one, that that elusive uh, Renault seat. Yeah. I don't know. Can't even, I can't guess there either. There's been too much misdirection in the in the media, and yeah. You know, I I I'd like to see K Mac just. Stay. All three teams straight faced have just said, "We're not we're not going to answer any questions about that." Yeah. I, I kind of think it will be K Mac, but I don't know. He's got all that Jack Jones money. Yeah. I don't know. I think that's what it's going to come down to with those with those those seats. Yeah, I don't know. Ha- Haas is probably the most unguessable. Yeah. If I had to guess, it's the most unguessable. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's so. really nobody like tied, and they're, yeah. and they're not in any rush to. Doesn't seem even like there's anyone anything. likely or being hinted or whatever. Nothing. Zero. Yeah. They don't get a lot of TV time or get asked too many questions either. But I don't know. I don't know. You want to finish this up with Sauber? Let's do it. If anyone's still listening, it's kind of interesting though. So Sauber started in 1993 by Peter Sauber. Mm-hmm. They've had one win. Yeah, Robert Kubica in Canada. One, yeah. one Grand Prix win. So in 2009, they started in 1993. In 2009, Peter Sauber sold 30% of the team to Manisha Kaltenborn, okay. who is now the team principal. Which is the, the woman... Obviously, a powerful, smart woman. She speaks like four or five languages, rich as hell, team principal, on top of this whole F1 thing. So now, this year, the entire capital of the team in shares was sold to a company called Longbow Finance, which is a Swiss financial company with strong ties. To a Swedish family, the Tetra Pak family, well, like the the, the people the, behind the, te- the Tetra Pak. He, they're right. they're so like Peter, they're basically like the the richest family in Sweden, or the second richest, whatever. I think the, they might be the third, but they're up there. They're way up there. Peter Sauber is stepping down from the board of the team. He will no longer be there. Manisha Kaltenborn also her capital is owned by Longbow. Longbow now. Oh yeah. She's, yeah. That she will remain as the CEO of the team. And her quote was something like, you know, this is common rhetoric when something like this happens. Mm-hmm. Longbo is going to be great for the team. They've got the money. They've got the focus. They want this. They're ready to advertise and push this team to the top. That's a common rhetoric. But here, this really makes sense. That's what she said. But you've always heard, like, since the 90s, since movies when we were kids, like, oh, you got to get this money in a Swiss bank account. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Everyone, everyone's heard that. It's in rap songs, rock music, movies, yeah, yeah. cartoons. Swiss bank account is where rich people put their money. Yeah. But the, the reason is that they have strict laws about what kind of financial information you actually have to disclose, even right. as a public company. Yeah. You don't have to say a lot. You don't have to say who's on your board, what they have, whatever, whatever, whatever. But since... Well, was, it, it's, it's actually interesting where that came from. It's kind of it, it kind of happened in a moment. Like, you know how, like, in, uh, in cer- certain countries, like, had, like... Um, you know that they had that there was a movement that there had to be a separation of church and state right like you know like the, the, yeah, yeah. the, the church state separation for switzerland one of the, their big up- upheavals was that they decided like it's like part of like who they were as a country that they mm-hmm. wanted to have a separation of yeah. banks yeah. and state so yes there's the there's not like they don't have to disclose like who owns like if, if they it's banks are very private there and you can do whatever you want with the with, to a lesser degree now, since since all this investigations into UBS and whatever financial collapse, it's not quite like that anymore. But it is still. Like, quite so different. since this sale was happening, a lot of it had to be disclosed or was disclosed. Forbes. This story is actually from Forbes. So that's how big of a money shift it is. But so let's look at this one first. These are the papers. For a company that was, this is from 2009, but a company that was called ME Promotions Limited. Okay. Which was a Swiss company. And if you look at the end there, the shareholders 
this is the details of one shareholder, I believe. The company had 1,000 shareholders. 600 of those were held by Marcus Thorbjorn Ericsson. So Marcus Ericsson owned 60% of this company. This company was shut down. This company was closed, I believe, the year after in 2010. And there was a company in the Netherlands reopened under the same name, also owned 66% by hey, 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 Marcus Thorbjorn Ericsson. Do you know? Do you know? Do you know, <laughs> do you know what, what what that what his middle name means? Please tell us. No, I'm just say so. So Thor, Thor, mm -hmm. you know, like the the god of thunder. Yeah. Bjorn is bear. He's Marcus Thor bear. <laughs> <laughs> thunder bear. Thunder bear. I hope that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> so, anyways, this company was shut down in 2010 because. There's always been uh, some sort of speculation about nobody knows yeah. who this guy's sponsors are, Marcus Erickson. He's mm -hmm. never he and he keeps a very straight face in the in the interviews in the paddock. He just keeps a straight face. You know, I work for Sauber. Sauber's gonna turn it around, but he never said why or who's doing it, who's mm -hmm. behind it, who's got the money. So this company was shut down, restarted in the Netherlands. If you go to the second page, there, there's a company called Sport Pro. Which you can see there has one third, thirty three percent of this company is owned by Longbow Finance. Okay. Mm. Now the other forty percent of the the company we're just looking at, Emmy Promotions, mm -hmm. is owned by Sport Pro. Sixty percent is owned by Mark Erickson. Forty percent is owned by Sport Pro. Sport thirty three percent of Sport Pro is owned by Longbow Finance, who just bought. Last week on Wednesday, 100% of the Sauber Formula One team. Okay, so if you look down, the other some of the other shareholders there who are big is one of them Jay was talking about, uh, which owns the t uh, Tetra Pak company. They made all their money from a patent on a Tetra Pak from the 1960s or something. Mm -hmm. Juice boxes, things like that. Milk, bot, milk cartons, all milk that cartons. shit. Milk wow. cartons. Everything some, that comes in a Tetra brick. Wow. Yeah. Certain types of shipping packages, some cardboard box type stuff. The the top three of the shareholders of this company now together own twenty eight point one billion dollars personally. The top three of these are men, I guess, or the mm -hmm. men who own these companies. And one of them so and so and sorry, the, the chairman of the board of this whole group now is a man called Raymond Barr Bear, mm -hmm. who was the CEO previously of Julius Baer, which is a giant international bank banking yeah. organization. It's, it's, no, it's 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 a one of those systemically important financial institutions mm. holding up the world <laughs> yeah. with money. So now, since last week, on one of Ted's notebooks, he was saying, you know, he he spoke to Manisha himself. He said and asked her, "How come you guys are running the 2015 Ferrari next year?" Mm -hmm. He was basically pissed because he, he he said, "Why don't you just come out and say it? Say that you don't have the money." Like, say that, like, you're just doing it for the money instead of, like, being all convoluted about it. So, this is why she didn't say that. Yeah. Because they got the money. They have the money now. <laughs> mm. And from people in the paddock, Sauber apparently has brought a whole bunch of new aero elements and stuff that they hadn't brought the whole season in the last three races now. Jesus. Just this, yeah. even yeah, yeah, just yeah. up to this past weekend. Yeah, it's like, but after long bowl, like, they just pew, turned up the tap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> right, because Ericsson's dad was also a rich ass and is obviously friends with these dudes yeah. he's a bajillionaire and his dad is also also a majillionaire <laughs> but what their their long-term focus now is so they have a focus for a couple of years mm -hmm. is next year they're not even going to bother competing right because right. there's no point in getting the 2016 ferrari engine because it has different points where it bolts to the chassis this right, is what right. monisha told ted right the different points where both of the chassis will have to rework that and work on the arrow and try to compete the suspensions on a wider longer car right so what's their long game the long game was that the su su suspicion is that they will be running in 2018 honda power mm -hmm. whether or not they're running ferrari or honda power is mm -hmm. irrelevant though they're just gonna save the money works strictly on the arrow for next year yeah and then come back with the perfect as perfect as they can get as mm -hmm. Albert can do but they got money now come back and then rework the chassis to fit the, their arrow with the new oh engine God. which will either be the 27 ferrari which should be sorted by then or honda will do what they promised and come out ahead and honda promised that they will have a second honda powered car after next year 
Sweet. There's a whole bunch Man, of that's, money. That's fucking crazy. So wait, it's nice. there's a whole bunch of money moving around. Sloshing around. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like a big fucking pit. That's moving why it, numbers. <laughs> but, like, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we were laughing at Marcus Erickson for crashing into a chicken and going to the hospital two weeks in a row. He went to the hospital was, two weeks in a row. It was a man eating alligator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. Wow. It seemed like he kept his cool for a reason. And, and, and listen, man, an investment in Sauber might not if if they can secure uh, a good deal. Secure what? <laughs> secure a good deal with with an engine company that or like with an engine manufacturer that will actually give him uh, the reins to like you know give her. Mm -hmm. Sauber is in a in a good position because their facilities are actually quite good. Apparently, if you go to the Sauber facilities, they have their own wind tunnel that not a lot of teams, especially not where they are on the grid, yeah. even have. Because from back in the day, uh, BMW, before they left the sport, mm -hmm. they dumped a bunch of money into Sauber. They were going to make him like the, their team. That's actually like somebody pointed on the chat that that was like when when uh, when they got their win is because they had a lot of like BMW money and their and their top ah, engines. Okay. Uh, so BMW basically built the build build some really good facilities uh, that. To this day, if you went back to that and just injected not a lot of money, but with like enough money to like bring the full potential out of it, you could do something. You could probably like bring him back to really where they should be, which is in my mind, uh, battling it out with with uh, with Force India. Because you remember those like those great battles that we've seen in the past, like back you know go back like four or five years, or yeah. actually well like you know, back to two thousand and twelve even. Uh, great battles in the midfield with Sauber. And and I think that's it's looking forward, it's a, it's it seems like a good deal. I'd I'd invest in Sauber if if the right. It's already been invested. In. One hundred yeah, percent yeah, yeah. is gone. They've bought a hundred percent. Two thousand nine was the end of the the well, start of the financial collapse. The last one, the end of the BMW reign, and that's mm. when Peter Sauber started to get out. Now he's completely out. Yeah, uh, uh, Louis, uh, uh, the Graham just on the chat just asked, like, do you know what they're gonna do with their wind tunnel? Because apparently, like, they can only afford to run at fifty percent of the time now. Well, yeah, that's what we're talking about. With more money, they'll be able to run it to like have like a full wind tunnel program, a full uh, compasses program. Get some uh, more engineers in there. Get some more more work done, and really bring the full um, potential out of the facilities that they have. And of course. The, the rules are going to keep swaying towards the supercomputer side yeah. and more CFD CFD and all that wind digital wind tunneling. Yeah. Cool. Is it one, one more quick point? Yeah. This is the last thing I got. Jensen button was complaining again about something else, uh, that there's not enough drug testing in formula one. I thought what this the was fuck, interesting. Jensen? Well, you know what he said? What? He said, so uh, like any international sport, they mm. are, uh, under the bubble of WADA, which is the World Anti-Doping Agency, they do the, the Olympics, soccer, yeah. all, all the international sports, basically. Okay. Even even a lot of national sports, like there's the USADA. There's individual countries have branches of them. Mm -hmm. They test for steroids, performance-enhancing drugs, etc., cetera, et cetera, et cetera, stuff like that. Button said he hasn't been P tested in three to four years, although in their contracts, driver contracts, team contracts, sporting regulations keeps them under strict rules of what they can and can't put into their bodies, mm -hmm. etc. He said that like they're still technically subject to random testing, but right. no they haven't they been haven't done it. And he said <clears throat> that actually he had they used to actually have to pee everybody after every race. But he, the reason he's bringing it up now he's saying is because next year with the new cars is going to go back to being very uh, physical. And yeah. Right now there's kind of saying like there's not really any need to take steroids because you don't need a super well, like, you need a superhuman physical body that maybe they basically some, just not give you any advantage so yeah, yeah maybe some, any something like provigil a little bit of caffeine mm -hmm. might help see so yeah, some mental drugs perhaps maybe some red bull yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> right to your iv yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i bet i bet the guys at red bull and toro so just get like injected with it before the race, like they, right they, the they take Red Bull baths, like yeah. honestly, yeah. Man, everything. <laughs> Their contact lenses, lenses, juices, Red Bull. They yeah. tell you, like, they put that shit on everything. <laughs> I'd be interested to see one of these guys get busted for steroids. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone thinks like Max Verstappen's a, a young guy. Oh, I bet. No, <laughs> the guy's like eighty. Yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> it's just Red Bull. It's just Red Bull <laughs> keeping him alive. <laughs> oh man! I right, and I guess with that we can end the show. But before we We're finish the show, yard. before we finish the show, I wanna like I can't I can't honestly thank 
you guys enough. We've had again for uh, another consecutive week of uh, a growing number of subscribers, of growing number of people that have been tuning in. Um, new people. Uh, we've been getting a lot of good feedback from many, many people. Uh, and honestly, we want to say again, thank you. Thanks a lot for everything. We we really we wouldn't be doing this if if people weren't listening really and and it, it is our motivation it really keeps us going yeah um and now somebody mentioned how can they uh, uh, one of our listeners like came out and straight up asked us like how how can we help uh, because you know how can they help because envelopes full of cash <laughs> <laughs> well we don't have like we, we aren't doing anything like a patreon campaign or anything like that but if you're listening up until this point clearly you like what we're doing and clearly you like what we're all about if you want to give us a hand with what we're doing and keep uh, this movement growing, mm -hmm. uh, please tell all of your F1 friends, please you know, hit us, hit, hit like, uh, on some of our stuff, go to, uh, Twitter, go to Instagram and go to, um, hit all subscribe. those, all yeah, those hit, hit subscribe, hit follow and, and tell people about us. I'm sure like, if, I'm sure if you're listening to this right now, you may know somebody that would like to listen to us. Go tell and your mama. <laughs> Go tell your friends. Honestly, she, she the most, the that. more subscribers that we have, and the more, uh, the more of this social media activity that we're getting, uh, the more we'll be able to get away with keeping, uh, bringing you guys some more awesome content, some more interviews, and more of that stuff. So really, if you want to see us keep going with this, please hit subscribe and please share it. You wanna thanks. It? You want to play this instead of the song for the yeah, show? Yeah, sure. Today? I just hope we don't get cut off. I'm not going to show it or anything. I just Yeah, just play the audio. So on uh, FP2, I threw up a hashtag SkyF1 tweet. Crafty Reddit. Although it does pass the FIE Bye, check, so they're not doing anything wrong. He's passed the, the flex test. I love Listen this. Some flat out fever. Thank you. Did you get that? Did you get that? What happened? I don't know. Why did it stop? Thank you for this. He says, speaking of the Earth car, we'll go back if Jensen like Button completes 20... You can... Fuck this up. He says, speaking of the Earth car, if Jensen Button completes 29 laps of the Mexican Grand Prix, he will have raced in his career two whole circumferences of the Earth. A distance 80,125 <laughs> kilometers. Now, that's the sort of thing, if Jensen Button's going to retire and never come back to Formula One as a driver at the end of the season, to know that you have raced around the Earth twice, two laps of the Earth in your career, that, that is that is something that you can use at a dinner party for the rest of your life. It's a serious stat, isn't it? It's a seriously good stat. I think he's also, to add to that flat out fever, he's also done a lap of the earth in testing at Barcelona alone. If you look at all the testing kilometers Jensen Button's done in Barcelona, so away from a, a race weekend, he's, he's done a whole circumference of the earth there. I wonder who's done the most. Oh, there is a question. And it's not a question 